There's nothing like being a member of a crew to make you realize just how important teamwork is to pull off a mission like this. Uh, it's really our pleasure to be able to come back at the you know, completion of the mission and be able to share some of the things uh, that went on, the things that we were able to experience, the things that we were able to do um, with all of you because we wouldn't have been able to experience them, we wouldn't have been able to do them without all of your help. And each and every person here and everyone that's listening um, contributes to the mission and in some way, just as uh, each of us contributed in some uh, small way to the success of the mission, this mission was absolutely awesome. Uh, I can't tell you how proud I am of uh, all of you for the hard work that you did, echoing Mr. Abbey's uh, comments about uh, how you were working under adverse conditions with the, uh, the threat and the specter of the furlough uh, hanging over your heads. Uh, you were able to pull off just an incredible, incredible mission. The things. Uh, things you're able to do, I don't think you appreciate just how great they really are. I'm also extremely proud of the, the crew that I was able to be a part of uh, to go off and do this. Uh, each of these guys was a, is a pro from top to bottom. Uh, they dedicated the last year of their lives to making sure that this all worked, just as many of you have, um, and I'm extremely proud of all of them. We do have uh, a couple of things we'd like to share with you today. We, we have about a 15-minute video that we've put together. Uh, that will highlight some of the uh, uh, parts of the mission. We'll actually tell the story of the mission from start to finish, uh, catching some of the highlights. Unfortunately, we can't capture everything. Uh, it would take too long. Uh, with one of the first things we did when we come together as a crew to learn to work together, I guess, is to design a patch. And um, we tried to capture all of the major events that are on the mission in our patch. This was our design. About three days before liftoff, we started out on a crystal clear cold morning on our trip from Houston to Florida. It was uh, a beautiful day, about 6.30. Just wanted to show you what it was like to roll down a dark runway, feel the excitement as we started a 700 mile leg of what was ultimately a 3.7 million mile trip. And I can just remember the, the excitement in my heart, and the thrill to, to lift off of uh, the dark runway and pop up into the sunlit sky. Soho steht für Sonnen- und Heliosphärenobservatorium, denn der Satellit soll die letzten großen Geheimnisse der Sonne erforschen. Die Kosten von rund 1,4 Milliarden Mark tragen je zur Hälfte die europäische Raumfahrtagentur ESA und die amerikanische NASA. Problemlos schoss die Rakete Atlas II mit ihrer 640 Millionen Mark teuren Fracht in den Nachthimmel von Florida. Anderthalb Millionen Kilometer wird sie Soho der Sonne näher bringen. Der Satellit soll dann die genauesten Bilder von der Sonne aufnehmen, die je gemacht wurden. Geparkt wird er an der Stelle, an der sich die Anziehungskraft von Sonne und Erde aufheben. So kann die Sonne in ständigem Tageslicht beobachtet werden. Die Instrumente von Soho sind so präzise, dass sie selbst in der Mitte eines Wirbelsturmes ein 500 Kilometer entferntes Flüstern aufnehmen. Dadurch sollen die Eruptionen auf der Sonne erforscht werden. Sie verursachen magnetische Stürme, die die Kommunikation und elektronische Geräte auf der Erde stören. Zwei Jahre lang wird Soho mindestens forschen. Dann hofft man mehr über den Planeten zu wissen, der für das Leben auf der Erde sorgt. Auch genauere Wettervorhersagen sollen dadurch möglich werden. Located eight light years or 108 trillion miles from our perch in the cosmos, the brown dwarf was spotted by a pair of telescopes atop Mount Palomar in California and the Hubble Space Telescope, which floats atop our atmosphere. Too cool to burn like the sun, too hot to be considered a planet, brown dwarfs were the focus of a 30-year search by astronomers. The newly discovered dwarf looks a lot like Jupiter, but is perhaps 50 times more massive. An unprecedented mission to learn more about Jupiter will reach a climax next week. After a six-year, 2.3 billion mile journey, NASA's Galileo space probe will arrive at the huge planet, enter its orbit, and on Thursday, drop a probe into its cloud-obscured atmosphere. Scientists say it will likely revolutionize their understanding of Jupiter and its moons. So far, all systems are go on the instrument-packed spacecraft. Where and when will the orbiting Chinese satellite come down? Stay with us. Welcome to Mission Control for the Galileo spacecraft, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. 
Hello, I'm Miles O'Brien, and this is a special edition of Science and Technology Week. This past week, the Rio Galileo completed its two and a third billion mile journey to the planet Jupiter. And like clockwork, its probe dove into the atmosphere of the planet, and rockets fired, putting the mothership into a Jovian orbit. Not bad for a spacecraft which has had more than its share of misfortune. With 20 years of work on the line, the tension was transparent in the final moments before Galileo's probe phoned home. And when it did, the joy was also transparent. Today's the big day for us. If we do this, we can do anything. And every day, you have to remind yourself, I'm doing something that's really been a dream for a long time. So uh, that makes it very rewarding and worth the risk. True to the flight plan, the 750-pound probe plunged into the atmosphere of the solar system's largest planet, its parachute deployed, and its radio turned on, sending data from half a dozen scientific instruments to the mothership 133,000 miles above. The orbiter asked the receiver on board the spacecraft, hey, have we heard from the probe yet? And it said, yep, and it sent that back to us, and we said, yep, we got the signal. <laughs> A few hours later, the Galileo orbiter gave NASA officials more reason to smile. A crucial rocket burn went off without a hitch, placing the craft into an orbit around Jupiter, which over the next few years will bring it close to three of the planet's largest moons. It took 20 years to get here, and we'll have another two good years. Galileo has had its share of problems. Delayed for years and then hobbled by a jammed antenna, the spacecraft earned a reputation for some hard luck. But on the day when some good fortune really counted, it came. Well, the scientists on the probe team are chomping at the bit to get their data. As it turns out, Jupiter isn't the only planet with large chunks of hardware crashing into it. The same thing could happen here on Earth this spring. A Chinese satellite the size of a small car is getting closer. And chances are it could fall to Earth in one piece. But fear not, the U.S. military is watching closely to see when and where it might hit Earth. Deep beneath Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado Springs at the U.S. Space Command Control Center, they realized the satellite was destined to fall a few months ago. We saw that uh, it was moving closer and closer to the Earth. Uh, and actually, if you want to use the term, uh, its orbit was beginning to degrade. It is the path of a failed Chinese military reconnaissance satellite. About the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, the two-ton craft is in an oblong orbit, which brings it as close as 97 miles above the Earth's surface. Moving at 17,000 miles an hour, it makes a revolution about every 90 minutes. If it gets below 87.5 minute revolution, that's when it's going to start actually re-entering the atmosphere. Each year, Space Command tracks about 100 man-made objects which fall out of orbit. In nearly every instance, the debris is incinerated as it enters the Earth's atmosphere. But the Chinese satellite, which is dropping out of orbit right now, was designed to preserve and return its payload of exposed film. So it is equipped with a heat shield, which increases its chances of surviving re-entry intact. And larger objects, which aren't shielded, can also survive the planetary plunge. In July of 1979, remnants of NASA's Skylab pounded into the Australian outback. The year before, debris from a nuclear-powered Soviet satellite fell across northern Canada. No one was hurt in either incident. The Chinese satellite is equipped with a parachute, and there's a slim chance it may deploy. But even if the craft takes an unarrested nosedive, chances are good it will do no harm, because most of our planet is covered by water. My sister-in-law asked me if I was concerned about this VW-sized object. I said, no, I'm much more concerned about the VW-sized objects that pass me every day, you know, going down Interstate 25. Nevertheless, here at Space Command, they will continue watching the doomed satellite very closely. They now predict it will fall to Earth in the middle of March, but precisely when and where will not be known until a few hours before impact. If it is headed for land, they will notify the appropriate authorities. Traveling at a few hundred miles an hour, this two-ton man-made meteor could pack the punch of a small bomb. The Military Space Command was created during the Cold War as a way to ensure falling space debris wouldn't inadvertently trigger a nuclear war. 
Kosmos -Satellit, Satellit ist in der vergangenen Nacht auf die Erde zurückgestürzt, ohne Schaden anzurichten. Nach Angaben der russischen Nachrichtenagentur Itatas verglühte der tonnenschwere Flugkörper größtenteils beim Eintritt in die Erdatmosphäre. Kleinere Teile seien südöstlich von Hawaii in den Pazifik gefallen. Der Satellit Kosmos 398 war gestern Abend in die Erdatmosphäre eingetreten und dabei größtenteils verglüht. Die verbliebenen Trümmer fielen etwa 2100 Kilometer südöstlich von Hawaii in den Ozean. Kosmos 398 wurde im Februar 1971 im Rahmen des sowjetischen Mondprogramms ins All geschossen. Nach Abschluss des nur viertägigen Programms galt er bereits als Weltraummüll. Kosmos 398, der 24 Jahre um die Erde gekreist ist und ihr dabei immer näher kam, sind jetzt auf die Erde gestürzt. Die bis zu 200 Kilogramm schweren Bruchstücke landeten in der vergangenen Nacht etwa 2100 Kilometer südöstlich von Hawaii im Pazifik. Im Rahmen des russischen Mondprogramms war Kosmos 398 zu Forschungszwecken ins All geschossen worden. In recent years, computer simulations and virtual reality have come of age. So much so, the technology is now keeping fighter pilots out of trouble and diplomats out of deadlocks. This program is called Power Scene, and powerful it is. This is a pilot's eye view of the flight from Hungary to the U.S. base in Tuzla, Bosnia. This is no approximation. It is exactly what pilots would see on the real flight. The vivid 3D images are rendered using satellite images and other data. U.S. pilots have used it for briefings on bombing runs, and during the recent peace talks in Dayton, it helped resolve a dispute over the size of a narrow swath of Serb-controlled land in Bosnia. It's been more than a week since the Galileo space probe slammed through the clouds of Jupiter on its own bombing run of sorts. NASA is still crunching the numbers from the encounter on December 7th, but earlier data fed back by the Galileo mothership during its approach in late October are giving scientists new insight into Jupiter's powerful magnetic field. The donut-shaped field, not unlike our aurora borealis, is apparently heating up. That could indicate increased volcanic activity on Io, one of the largest of Jupiter's 16 known moons. On Tuesday, NASA scientists were planning to release the first data from the Galileo space probe, which plunged into Jupiter a few weeks ago. But like most federal workers, the scientists were sitting at home on furlough. The space agency promises a rain check sometime after the first of the year. The Russians now say they would like to use their existing station, the Mir, as the core of the new orbiting laboratory. NASA officials are opposing this idea because it would prompt major design modifications, delays, and an increase in the cost to U.S. taxpayers. As we told you last June, NASA is already building pieces based on the previously agreed upon design. It is no longer simply a paper project. A dozen years and nearly as many revisions later, NASA is finally hammering out the final draft of its orbiting space station. The way I see it, this is the greatest technological project ever attempted. Boeing engineer Jim Waterman oversees construction of the station at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. His team has already bent, built, and burnished more than 30,000 pounds of flight hardware. This is Node 1. Node 1 is the first U.S.-built component of the International Space Station. NASA hopes to launch it in December of 1997. It is the first to fly for good reason. The node is a, um, is like a connector block. I equate the little wooden block in the Tinker Toy set where you plug in sticks. So this is the little wooden block. That's where all the modules will connect on the International Space Station. The U.S. and Russian space agencies plan to spearhead construction and assembly of this million-pound orbiting Tinker Toy. They are joined by the Japanese, Europeans, and Canadians, all planning to build their own components in laboratories. NASA estimates it will take 34 launches, at least 20 of them shuttle missions, to get all the building supplies and astro workers to this far-flung construction site. Putting a man on the moon was easy. Uh, making this all fit together for the first time in space is a very, very complex operation. NASA and Boeing are sorting through the engineering complexities by logging lots of hours working on space station mock-ups in tanks which simulate weightlessness. And they are relying heavily on computer-aided design to try and ensure all the pieces will fit together. We can simulate the 
integration activity of the station. We can simulate the assembly of the station all before the hardware hits the factory floor. And more importantly, before the hardware hits orbit, where it really has to work. According to the current plan, the Russians will launch the first piece of the International Space Station, a propulsion module, in November of 97. A fireball appeared over central Japan during daylight hours on Sunday. Hundreds of residents in Tokyo and its suburbs called the police, fire stations and weather observatories after spotting the object. The witnesses say that the glittering object raced across the sky accompanied by loud noise and white smoke. Officials are now checking to see if the object was a meteorite. There were no reports of an explosion or injuries. A teen later found what appeared to be a fragment of the flying object after seeing it fall about 50 meters ahead of his car. Zunächst für ein UFO hielten, entpuppte sich als ein nur 62 Gramm schwerer Steinmeteorit. Der Himmelskörper prallte etwa 60 Kilometer nordöstlich von Tokio auf die Erde. Anwohner hatten zuvor einen lauten Knall gehört. So, und jetzt schauen wir zum Schluss auch noch mal über den großen Teich nach Amerika. Das ist ein Bild von heute Nachmittag. Amerika ist uns ja um einige Stunden hinterher, was die Tageszeit angeht. Dort ist also die Sonne erst aufgegangen. Und wir sehen hier gerade noch Florida. Sie haben gehört, der Blizzard ist über Amerika hinweggefegt. Es ist ordentlich Kaltluft von Norden nach Süden geströmt. Man sieht es hier über dem Golf von Mexiko, haben sich eine Menge Wolken entwickelt. Und die Kaltluft, die hat jetzt hier so die Südspitze von Florida erreicht. Allerdings ist das Tief seit gestern nicht sehr weit gezogen. Das heißt, es wird also teilweise auch noch Schnee bringen in den USA. Und man sieht hier, wo die Kaltluft rübergezogen ist, zum Teil eben auch Schnee. Und selbst in Atlanta hat es sogar mal zwei Zentimeter Schnee gegeben. Das war's vom Wetter für heute. Ich wünsche Ihnen noch einen schönen Abend. Kein Ort in den Bergen, sondern die 14. Straße in Washington, D.C. Nur mehr Autos mit Allradantrieb haben eine Chance, einigermaßen durchzukommen. An die 70 cm Neuschnee innerhalb von 42 Stunden legen seit Sonntag große Teile der Ostküste Amerikas lahm. Erst der Kongress, dann die Natur. Hunderttausende von Bundesangestellten können weiterhin nicht zur Arbeit, denn nach dem politisch verordneten Zwangsurlaub versperrt ihnen nun die höhere Gewalt den Weg zur Arbeit. Einziger Lichtblick, auch Kriminelle werden laut Polizei an ihrer Tätigkeit gehindert. Gehwege und Straßen versinken in der weißen Pracht. Die Fußgänger werden durch die Schneemassen zwangsläufig zu Straßengängern. Statt auf vier Rädern versucht manch einer auf zwei Brettern vorwärts zu kommen. Der schlimmste Schneesturm dieses Jahrhunderts, wie er bereits genannt wird, hat auch das politische Leben der Hauptstadt lahmgelegt. In- und ausländische Reisende hängen an den Busbahnhöfen oder Flughäfen fest. Baltimore, Washington, New York und Boston. Die Maschinen stecken fest. Das öffentliche Leben ist weitgehend lahmgelegt. In sieben Bundesstaaten wurde der Notstand ausgerufen. Für sie war es ein großer Spaß. Per Ski am Weißen Haus vorbei. Aber ansonsten brachte der Jahrhundert Blizzard vor allem Probleme. Ein Schneepflug befreite zwar den Amtssitz des Präsidenten von der Weißen Pracht. Nach 21 Tagen Zwangsurlaub wegen der Haushaltssperre mussten die meisten Regierungsangestellten heute jedoch erneut zu Hause bleiben. Nur mit Mühe kam der Verkehr in der Bundeshauptstadt wieder in Gang. Schneehöhen erreichten an der Ostküste bis zu einem Meter. An vielen Stellen wurden jahrzehntealte Rekorde gebrochen. Schwere Zeiten für die Obdachlosen. Über 20 Menschen kamen bisher ums Leben. Nichts geht mehr auf den Flughäfen der Ostküste. Zehntausende mussten die Nacht in den Abfertigungsgebäuden verbringen. Und auch New Yorks Straßen wurden zu Fußgängerzonen. Erstmals seit 18 Jahren hatten die Schulen geschlossen und auch die Vereinten Nationen machten dicht. Hier in Washington ist der Schneesturm erst einmal vorbei. Aber die Neuenglandstaaten müssen mit weiteren Schneefällen rechnen. Und es wird noch Tage dauern, bis sich das Leben hier an der Ostküste völlig normalisiert haben wird. Ja, heute wieder der Blick über den großen Teich. Den amerikanischen Kontinent kann ich Ihnen allerdings nicht zeigen. Der liegt noch im Dunkeln. Denn das Bild ist etwas früher aufgenommen worden als gestern. Dort ist also noch Nacht zu dieser Zeit. Aber wir sehen hier die Vordergrenze der, des Tiefs das also diesen ganzen Schnee in Amerika gebracht hat. Und wenn wir hier weiter rüber schauen auf den Atlantik, dann kann man hier gerade noch so die Grenze von Spanien erkennen. Und ich schalte jetzt mal auf das nächste Bild und gehe mal rüber. Da sieht man hier diese Vordergrenze der Wolken. Das ist also das Tief, das Schneetief von Amerika. Davor rauscht hier nochmal kräftig Kaltluft nach Süden. Und hier in Spanien wird es auch wieder einiges an Regen bringen. Aber auch in den nächsten Tagen wird sich das ganze System nicht viel weiter nach Osten bewegen. Das hatte ich ja schon gesagt. Das 
Das heißt also, die Kaltluft wird immer draußen auf dem Atlantik bleiben und bei uns ändert sich wenig. Das war's für heute. Schönen Abend wünsche ich Ihnen noch. Der Tag nach dem großen Blizzard. Nun heißt es schaufeln, schaufeln, schaufeln. Wege aus den Häusern, Bürogebäuden und Geschäften müssen freigemacht werden. Armadas von Schneeflügen sind unterwegs. Der Bewegungsfluss muss wieder in normalen Bahnen verlaufen. Krankenwagen und Feuerwehr sind noch immer rund um die Uhr im Einsatz. Die ungewöhnlichen Schneemassen lassen Dächer einbrechen, mancherorts sogar ganze Leichtbauten. Auch der Flugverkehr läuft so langsam wieder an. 3000 Fluggäste allein in Chicago warten seit zwei Tagen auf einen Weiterflug. Der schlimmste Schneesturm seit Jahrzehnten hat hier zwar zwei Tage lang alles lahmgelegt und für manche Unbequemlichkeit gesorgt. Hunderte von Menschen waren in ihren Häusern eingeschneit. Die Laune hingegen war selten so gut. Radio, Fernsehen, Zeitungen sind voll von lustigen Geschichten. Anekdoten, witzige Schnappschüsse, das Schneesturmbaby. An Kuriositäten mangelt es nicht. Kurios auch der Kontrast zwischen Ost- und Westküste. In L.A. herrscht mit 30 Grad die reinste Hitze. Von Blizzard keine Spur. Continent as an area of light snow moves out of the northeastern United States. We'll see a new low pressure center developing across the central U.S. It's going to drop southeastward following a similar track to the blizzard of 1996 that occurred over the weekend in the northeastern United States. Our January 11th, shortly after midnight, uh, the crew started getting ready in the uh, suit-up room. Uh, here you see the pilot on the mission, Brent Jett, a Navy flyer, was here getting ready for his first flight. Koichi Wakata, whom you've met, uh, joins us from Japan uh, as a mission specialist. Here he is preparing for his uh, first mission as well. Uh, the other experienced space flyer on the mission, Dr. Leroy Chow. And you can see Leroy was ready to go. He had a lot ahead of him, and he was very anxious. Winston Scott, Navy captain, who's going to be the flight engineer on the mission, also a future spacewalker along with Leroy. Uh, here he is in his preparation, setting up his uh, microphones and his comm carrier. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Dan Barry, another future spacewalker. And you can tell by the look in his eyes, he is ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> While we were getting ready, the vehicle was undergoing its final preparations. And then when we got to the launch minus three hour point, it was time for us to uh, depart the crew quarters where we'd been and walked out, and we were greeted by many of our friends. Some of you are here today, and we appreciate you coming down to wish us well on our journey. We boarded the, uh, the crew astro van. We're preparing to shortly to go live to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida for the imminent launch of the U.S. Space Shuttle Endeavor. Six astronauts, including one from Japan, are aboard the shuttle, ready for a nine-day mission. A new snowstorm has hit parts of the northeastern United States. Much of the East Coast is still buried under snow from one of the century's worst blizzards, which hit earlier in the week. Weather forecasters say more heavy snow is on the way. Crews in Boston, Massachusetts have run out of places to pile the accumulating snow. And Boston's Logan Airport had to close again temporarily to allow workers to clear the runways. Government employees in Washington had not gone to work for three days because of the blizzard. This followed three weeks of a partial government shutdown caused by an impasse in budget talks. But most offices are expected to open Thursday. From CNN Center in Atlanta, I'm Miles O'Brien, and we are about one minute away from the launch of the Space Shuttle Endeavour, the first shuttle mission of 1996, the tenth for the Orbiter Endeavour. So far, the weather is good at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and aside from a small communications problem, all systems are go on the space shuttle. The six-man crew is on board, strapped in and ready. They are led by Commander Brian Duffy, who is on his third shuttle flight. The crew includes a Japanese astronaut, Koichi Wakata, who will be instrumental in retrieving a Japanese scientific satellite, which has been in orbit for a year. The astronauts will also release, then retrieve another science satellite, and they'll conduct two six-and-a-half-hour spacewalks to test tools and techniques which might be used to build the International Space Station. We're about 15 seconds away. Let's listen in to Lisa Malone of NASA. Nine, eight. We have a go for engine start. Five, four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Endeavour in pursuit of a Japanese satellite. Houston now controlling. Roll program, Houston. Roger roll, Endeavour. 
overall maneuver is uh, complete aboard the Orbiter Endeavour. The Orbiter is now in a head-down position on course for 28 and a half degrees, 250 nautical mile orbit in pursuit of the Space Flyer unit for rendezvous and capture on Saturday morning. engines have now throttled down as the orbiter prepares to pass through the area of maximum dynamic pressure on the vehicle. Three main engines now throttling back up. Endeavour Houston, go with throttle up. Roger, go throttle up. Endeavour's three liquid-fueled engines are now back at full throttle. The orbiter is now downrange from the Kennedy Space Center of 10 nautical miles. The orbiter's traveling 2,600 feet per second, or about 1,700 miles per hour. The altitude is passing through 90,000 feet. The three hydraulic systems are in excellent shape as are the fuel cells. The main engines are still performing at full throttle. Approaching two minutes into the flight, standing by for burnout and separation of the twin solid rocket boosters. Shuttle Endeavour's solid rocket boosters have separated from the orbiter. They do the lion's share of lofting the shuttle into orbit. They have separated. They will drop into the ocean where they will be recovered. The six-man crew of Endeavour is on its way into orbit. Stay with CNN for continuing coverage of the nine-day shuttle mission, which includes two spacewalks. From the CNN Center in Atlanta, I'm Miles O'Brien. We now rejoin CNN Newsroom in progress. <laughs> Endeavour ist wieder im All. Der Flug ist der erste von acht geplanten Shuttle-Missionen in diesem Jahr. Die Raumfähre war mit 23 Minuten Verspätung in Cape Canaveral gestartet. Ursache waren Kommunikationsprobleme. An Bord der Fähre sind sechs Astronauten, fünf Amerikaner und ein Japaner. Neun Tage werden sie im All bleiben. In dieser Zeit soll ein im März vergangenen Jahres ausgesetzter japanischer Satellit wieder zurückgeholt werden. Höhepunkt dieses Shuttle-Fluges werden zwei Weltraumspaziergänge sein. Die amerikanische Raumfähre Endeavour ist von Cape Canaveral aus zu einem neuntägigen Flug ins All gestartet. An Bord sind sechs Astronauten. Sie wollen einen defekten japanischen Satelliten wieder einfangen. Geplant sind auch zwei Weltraumspaziergänge. Dabei sollen Materialien und Werkzeuge für eine künftige Raumstation getestet werden. Officials at the U.S. Space Agency NASA say that unless there's a quick resolution to the budget crisis, Thursday's launch of the Space Shuttle Endeavour might be the last mission for some time. NASA has eight manned missions scheduled for 1996, including three rendezvous with the Russian space station Mir. Bauten an Bord ist die US-Raumfähre Endeavour von Cape Canaveral aus ins All gestartet. Die Besatzung soll während des neun Tage dauernden Fluges unter anderem zwei Satelliten bergen. Bei zwei Weltraumspaziergängen ist geplant, Material und Werkzeug für eine künftige internationale Raumstation zu testen. The Space Shuttle Endeavour is en route to its weekend rendezvous with the Japanese satellite. The shuttle's crew of six took off from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida today. It was before sunup when they left. On Saturday, the crew was to retrieve a four-ton reusable satellite laden with experiments and pack it into the cargo bay. The crew also will release and then retrieve a U.S. science satellite during their nine-day mission. Da ist die amerikanische Raumführer Endeavour zu einem neuntägigen Flug ins All aufgebrochen. An Bord sind fünf amerikanische Astronauten und ein Japaner. Sie wollen unter anderem einen japanischen Satelliten wieder einfangen, der seit März im Weltall schwebt. Als Höhepunkt des Fluges sind zwei Weltraumspaziergänge geplant. Dabei sollen Werkzeuge und Material getestet werden, die bei dem Aufbau einer internationalen Raumstation von Ende 1997 an eingesetzt werden. 
have a go for it. Booster ignition and liftoff of an ever pursuit of the Japanese satellite. Houston, I can pull Roll program, Houston. Roger, roll, Endeavour. to the uh, vibration and noise during first stage on the solid rocket boosters, uh, the ride during second stage on the main engines is uh, smooth all the way to Miko. The U.S. Space Shuttle Endeavour has had a close encounter with one of the 7,000 pieces of space debris orbiting Earth. Earlier Friday, it had to fire its jets to get out of the way of a dead Air Force satellite. Although the shuttle's six-man crew was never in any danger during the incident, it isn't the first time this has happened, and probably won't be the last. Earlier, CNN's Miles O'Brien spoke with the crew of the Endeavour. I know recently NASA Administrator uh, Daniel Golden was actually critical of the pace of new rocket development within NASA. There really hasn't been a ground-up uh, new rocket developed uh, in the U.S. Uh, recently. Uh, would you be among those that would call for such uh, efforts, especially in light of the budget constraints in Washington? Well, I think, uh, I think a new vehicle would be a good thing. I think we ought to start planning for a new vehicle. We don't need one right now. The space shuttle's been doing fine, uh, even though a lot of the technology is what you would call by today's standards old. Um, it's proven to be a very reliable, reliable vehicle again, and we have no need to immediately replace it, but I think we ought to start looking at, um, at, at a new vehicle. By the way, for our viewers, that's mission specialist uh, Leroy Chow. And let me uh, shift into the spacewalks which are planned here. I know you will be involved in uh, two of the spacewalks. There are two, each of them six and a half hours long. Uh, the object is to uh, look at tools, techniques, and equipment which might be used to build the International Space Station. Um, I, you almost get the sense that uh, NASA is doing its best to get as much spacewalking experience in it as possible uh, so that you have an experienced group of um, astro construction workers when it comes time to build that space station. Is that what's going on? Well, that's certainly part of it, Miles. Uh, you know, we'd like to get some folks experience so that we can have that experience to draw upon when we do get into full swing of uh, station assembly. Uh, Winston Scott behind me, he's, uh, he's going to do the second EVA with me, and Dan Barry, who's working on the mid-deck right now, will do the first one with me, and that'll be three new uh, EVA people on this flight uh, that have, get some experience. But uh, along with that, we're also, as you mentioned, looking at the design concepts, building concepts, and maintenance concepts for the space station. This is very critical. The, uh, the results that we get from these flight tests are going to feed directly right back into the space station program to make sure, you know, and they'll tweak what they have to tweak to make sure that we get a buildable and, uh, and a reliable station. Let's move over to uh, Winston Scott. I know when you're on your spacewalk, you're going to uh, spend a little bit of time in the shade of the shuttle. Uh, 100 degrees below zero Fahrenheit are the projected temperatures. And I suppose folks in the Northeast concerned about a blizzard should think about that for a moment. Tell me about the thermal modifications on this spacesuit. Are you uh, satisfied that you're going to be nice and toasty up there? You know, Miles, as a matter of fact, I am. I'm very confident that I'm going to be nice and toasty. Uh, the modifications have been worn before. They've looked at uh, how the other guys felt when they wore them a couple of uh, missions before me. They made improvements. and. I'm uh, really not that concerned about it. In fact, I'm looking forward to it. The chief goal of Endeavour's nine-day mission is the capture of a Japanese space satellite that is planned for Saturday. His name is the household... ...closer to state-of-the-art telephone service Friday. Europe's Ariana Spas is set to launch Malaysia's first satellite, beginning what will be an explosion of orders from Asian countries. Asia is the place to be at the moment. If you're in the satellite business, you go to Asia. It's such a large market and TV's just starting in a big way there with satellite television, then they've got to launch satellites. The boom is encouraging rocket launching companies to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to increase market share. The industry is also consolidating. Lockheed Martin's recent move to take over Laurel's space arm, the latest example. Boeing has joined some European firms to offer a novel and possibly cheaper idea 
of a floating launch pad, while McDonnell Douglas is quickly updating its popular Delta rockets. But those U.S. giants face growing competition from Russia, China, and India. All are trying to take business from the dominant European firm. Ariane Espas has 50% of the market with its newest weapon, the Ariane 5 rocket, set for send-off in May. We expect, of course, it will be an interesting challenge. We expect that Ariane Space, uh, if we are successful this year with Ariane 5, uh, will be able to, to, to continue uh, to be the commercial leader. But success is certainly not guaranteed. 1994 saw many failures, causing a further backlog of orders. But that and a 30% increase in new orders expected by 1999 will keep business brisk. However, it may lead to a shortage of launch date availabilities just when demand is expected to rocket forward. Shuttle Endeavour has been playing cat and mouse with a couple of satellites. It dodged a defunct U.S. Air Force satellite and chased down a Japanese satellite to be retrieved on Saturday. CNN's John Zarella reports the Endeavour mission won't be all cat and mouse, though. There are some rats in the mix as well. Hundreds of years from now, if humans travel to distant planets, rats may be largely responsible for understanding how long durations in space affect the body. Booster ignition and liftoff of Endeavour in pursuit. As it lifted off from the Kennedy Space Center, the shuttle Endeavour carried dozens of rats in its mid-deck, all babies between 5 and 15 days old. If you don't have the influence of gravity at such and such an age, even when the animal comes back to Earth, it will be, if you will, a, a space animal, and it will never be able to readapt its nervous system to, to Earth. The rat astronauts had to be age-specific because scientists believe there are critical periods in neurological development. Within three weeks, rats develop a nervous system. It takes years to develop in a human. So only to be in, on a shuttle, let's say, for 10 days, uh, in a human's terms, is 10 days out of 70 years. In a rat's terms, it's 10 days out of three years. So you get a, this very accelerated developmental period. Because of the potential for shuttle launch delays and the need for precise rat ages, an animal breeding center outside Germantown, New York, had to breed and continue to breed thousands of rats. Scientists aren't sure what to expect when the rats come back. It's basic science that is going to be done. It's, it's basic science that's going to be looking at how does the brain, which is the most complex organ in the body, how we really don't understand a lot about how the brain develops. An understanding of the brain's workings could help researchers find a cure for paralysis. Scientists believe neurological development in microgravity will be different than on Earth. In the absence of gravity, strong leg muscles might not be necessary. Humans traveling to distant planets in the future would have children born along the way. These rat studies may provide insights into how the human body might develop differently in space. The descendants of Earthlings would truly be spacemen and women. John Zarella, CNN, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The U.S. Mid-Atlantic and Northeastern states are getting a one-two punch of winter weather. In Washington, people still trudging through drifts led by last weekend's blizzard are being hit with a second snowstorm. Much of the U.S. federal government is closed again. We'll have more of the world's news after Flip Spiceland as a look at the world's weather. We are, for a change, finally going to see some calm weather across much of the United States. This is a vigorous storm moving up the eastern seaboard of the U.S. with some snowfall associated with it. Another cold front will stretch down through eastern Canada into the Great Lakes region. We'll find some light snow scattered along that frontal boundary. Temperatures in the western United States have been very, very warm. As we move on out of south...
French oceanographer Jacques Cousteau has launched an appeal for financial help in his project to build a new research ship. The original ship, Calypso, sank in Singapore Harbor on Monday. While Cousteau had long planned to replace the vessel with a high-tech Calypso II, he now says the ship should belong to everyone. CNN's Siobhan Darrow has more. For more than 40 years, Jacques Cousteau's Calypso ship battled the world's waters in search of the secrets that lay beneath braving treacherous conditions to draw attention to the precarious plight of marine life. But after surviving many close calls at sea, the world-famous minesweeper-turned-research ship sank in a shallow Singapore shipyard after being hit by a barge. We have together uh, been fighting hurricanes, storms, uh, bad uh, situations and good situations. We have explored uh, difficult parts of the world. We have a written history in uh, discovering uh, the underwater world and bringing with us young scientists to understand it and to describe it for the, for the generations to come. But the 85-year-old French oceanographer, while saddened by the loss of a ship that was more like a friend, is, as always, looking to the future. It's this enormous package of common life that I am losing. In fact, uh, the emotion that I described uh, was terrible and very strong. However, <coughs> in all my life, I have reacted to bad news by uh, a new source of decision to be more active and more efficient. So after more than 50 expeditions with the Calypso around the world, Cousteau's dream is to launch Calypso II. Cousteau was planning to replace the aging ship anyway with a more high-tech version equipped with a marine lab and TV studio with an estimated price tag of $20 million. 25 years ago, it was impossible to talk about the environment to anybody without getting a laugh. What's that? What are you talking about? And <clears throat> I think one of the achievements that we have done, we have helped tremendously to launch the consciousness, the awareness, and the consciousness of people that we were living in a fixed planet that we had to take care of. Cousteau hopes for a dignified end for his collaborator, as he calls his ship, a museum for children perhaps, a future like its past, bringing knowledge to millions about underwater adventures unsurpassed. Siobhan Darrow, CNN, Paris. Sea cows, they're dying at an alarming rate. Bob Height reports researchers in the U.S. state of Florida are searching for answers. To most of us, power plants are a source of electricity. But along the Florida coastline, they are a source of warmth to the endangered manatee. In wintertime, these gentle mammals seek out the warm water that is pumped out of the plant's cooling systems. So it was here at the Big Bend Power Plant on Tampa Bay that marine scientists came to corral some manatees for testing and satellite tracking. The annual statewide aerial survey indicates there are only some 1,800 manatees left in Florida, and in 1995, Manatee mortality was up with over 200 reported deaths. 30% of the fatalities are human related and principally from propellers. While this effort may appear violent, the manatees are unharmed as they are brought up on Big Ben's soft mud bank. What wounds they do display have already been inflicted by propellers. But this mission is focusing on dangers that are less easily identified. Brad Weigel, a scientist with the Florida Marine Research Institute, is heading the operation. We know that uh, the number of calves, the number of small animals that die has gone up. Uh, that could be a result of an increasing population. It could be the result of, of females, however, that are, are young and are reproducing for the first time and abandon their calves. They aren't mothers with experience. So we, we have two conflicting stories. It's going to take us a little while to sort that out. To that end, with their propeller wounds treated, blood is taken for testing, 
and Beth Wright implants tiny electronic ID tags. And it works like uh, when your groceries are scanned at the grocery store. It's just a microchip that's activated by the reader, and they'll have these tags for the rest of their life. Florida's lieutenant governor was also on hand, affixing satellite tracking belts. Buddy McKay says being able to plot the manatees course may help Floridians chart their own. If we can figure out how to act as if we're part of the same ecosystem, well, then we could all survive and what an immeasurably better place it'll be. Finally, the manatees are freed to go on about their business of being manatees. And the scientists, now with more information to go on, can go on about their business of trying to save the manatees. Bob Hype reporting for CNN. That's all for this edition of World News at the CNN Center in Atlanta. I'm Jonathan Mann. Good night, Hillary. Good night, John, and I'm Hillary Bowker in London. Thanks for joining us. World Business Today is next. What goes up must come down. American balloonist Steve Fawcett found the old saying to be true sooner than he expected. Just two days after beginning his daring attempt at the first round-the-world balloon flight, Fawcett safely made a forced landing in a hayfield at Hampton, New Brunswick in eastern Canada. The millionaire soybean trader who invested $300,000 in the project said he had to end the trip suddenly due to technical problems. On orbit, uh, we had to concentrate on our first major objective of the mission. That was the retrieval of the Japanese uh, Space Flyer Unit, or SFU satellite. Here you see a good shot of the SFU and it's with its solar arrays deployed. Uh, it was critical for these solar arrays to be retracted and latched prior to the SFU's retrieval. And as we closed inside of a half a mile of SFU, you can see Brian firing the jets, uh, primary RCS jets, to slow down Endeavour's closure rate on the satellite. Meanwhile, Koichi and Winston are in the front uh, cockpit, part of the cockpit, monitoring the solar array retraction, which didn't go very well. Due to the fact uh, that we didn't have latching indication of the solar array panels of the SFU, the Sagamihara Operation Center located in Japan sent commands to jettison the two solar arrays to safely return the SFU to Earth. Brian maneuvered the orbiter to a distance within the grapple range of the shuttle's robotic arm. And then I started to maneuver the robotic arm to grapple the SFU. This is the moment of the capture of the SFU, and this was the end of the 10-month voyage of the space flyer unit since it had been launched by a Japanese H-2 rocket uh, last March. You can see Koichi uh, concentrating here as he gets ready to, to uh, berth the satellite. After grapple, the SFU was uh, maneuvered to, to be berthed in the payload bay. Like he's ready to slam dunk that one. <laughs> <laughs> and then Orbiter's electrical power was supplied to the SFU's uh, heater system uh, through this electrical umbilical. Japanese astronaut Koichi Wakata snagged his country's research satellite with the shuttle's 15-meter cargo arm and slowly lowered it into the Endeavour's payload bay. 
The retrieval was not without its hitches. Astronauts were forced to cut loose the satellite's solar array panels when they failed to lock in place. The Japanese satellite was then maneuvered into a new position so the scrap panels would not hit the Endeavour. US-Raumfähre Endeavour hat schon am zweiten Tag ihre wichtigste Mission erfüllt. An Bord des Satelliten befinden sich seit März 1995 Eier des rotbäuchigen Wassermolchs. Die Wirkung der Schwerelosigkeit auf die Eier soll nun in Japan festgestellt werden. Weiteres Ziel der Reise ist das Aufsetzen und Wiedereinfangen eines US-Forschungssatelliten. An Bord sind Ratten und ihre Jungen. Getestet werden Folgen auf das Nervensystem von den Säugetieren. Die US-Raumfähre Endeavour nur knapp einem Zusammenstoß mit Weltraumschrott entgangen ist, erfüllte die Mannschaft jetzt ihre wichtigste Aufgabe. Hochkonzentriert manövrierte der japanische Astronaut Kuichio Wakata mit einem Greifarm einen Forschungssatelliten an Bord, der fast ein Jahr lang Daten im Weltall gesammelt hatte. Auf dem Programm der neuntägigen Mission stehen auch noch zwei Weltraumspaziergänge. Den Astronauten der amerikanischen Raumfähre Endeavour ist es gelungen, einen japanischen Satelliten an Bord zu holen. Das komplizierte Manöver dauerte eine halbe Stunde und wurde mit Hilfe eines 15 Meter langen Roboterarms durchgeführt. Der wiederverwendbare Satellit war im März von einer japanischen Trägerrakete ins All befördert worden und wird jetzt mit Forschungsergebnissen nach Japan zurückgebracht. Japanese astronaut Koichi Wakata snagged his country's research satellite with the shuttle's 15 meter cargo arm and slowly lowered it into the Endeavour's payload bay. The retrieval was not without its hitches. Astronauts were forced to cut loose the satellite's solar panels when they failed to lock in place. The Japanese satellite was then maneuvered into a new position so the scrap panels would not hit the Endeavour. Eine europäische Trägerrakete hat in den frühen Morgenstunden zwei Satelliten ins All befördert. Der Start war bereits für den 10. Januar geplant, dann aber wegen technischer Probleme verschoben worden. Premiere für das neue Kontrollzentrum Jupiter 2. Die Ariane 44L, der bisher leistungsstärkste Typ der Trägerrakete, hob um 0.10 Uhr von Kourou in französisch Guyana in Südamerika aus ab. 26 Minuten nach dem Start setzte Ariane ihre 4,3 Tonnen schwere Nutzlast ab. Einen US-Satelliten, der die Telekommunikationsdienste über weiten Teilen der USA, Südamerikas und Afrikas sicherstellt und den ersten malaysischen Satelliten überhaupt. Die Vermarktungsgesellschaft Ariane Space, die im letzten Jahr 13 Satelliten ins All befördert hat, hat nach diesem Start noch Aufträge über 38 Satellitentransporte vorliegen. Die europäische Ariane-Rakete hat vergangene Nacht zwei Satelliten für Telekommunikation ins All gebracht. 20 Minuten nach dem Start vom Raumfahrtzentrum Kourou in französisch Guyana wurde ein amerikanischer Satellit auf seiner Umlaufbahn ausgesetzt, wenig später ein malaysischer. Es war der 82. Start einer Ariane-Rakete und der erste in diesem Jahr. Die Betreibergesellschaft Ariane Space hat derzeit Aufträge für den Transport von 38 Satelliten und plant 1996 elf weitere Starts. Die Astronauten der amerikanischen Raumfähre Endeavour haben heute einen japanischen Satelliten eingefangen und an Bord geholt. Allerdings mussten zwei Sonnenpaddel gekappt werden, da es nicht gelang, sie zusammenzufalten. Beide schweben jetzt im All. Der japanische Astronaut Koisho Wakata steuerte den Greifarm, mit dem der Forschungssatellit, in dem unter anderem Eier japanischer Molche sind, in die Ladebucht der Fähre gehievt wurde. Für das Zurückbringen zur Erde zahlt Japan der NASA 72 Millionen Mark. Hallo und willkommen, ich bin Miles O'Brien. Ever since it appeared in the desert outside Tucson, Arizona, the Biosphere 2 has stood like a stunning magnet for attention and controversy. The three and a half acre sealed world, complete with ocean, coral reefs, rainforest, wetlands, and agriculture, opened amid great hype and lofty scientific expectations. But today, many view the biosphere as more stunt than science. Enter Columbia University. The prestigious Ivy League school is now running the biosphere, hoping its reputation isn't already sealed. Mark Bernheimer has the story. No one knew quite what to make of the Biosphere 2 project when its eight inhabitants locked themselves inside the huge steel and glass structure back in 1991. The plan was to live in an entirely self-sustained, isolated environment for two years. But the Biosphere project quickly invited controversy and scientific ridicule. Oxygen systems failed, crops died, and outside supplies were reportedly smuggled in. Now, in an attempt to restore credibility to the project, scientists from Columbia University have been brought in to take over. 
I don't think we should underestimate what's, what's come before. There's been some misdirection in the project. That's not to say this is not a world-class facility and we don't have world-class scientists here right now, but we do have to do some work, uh, some serious work, and it has to become uh, scientifically rigorous, and it will be. The image makeover comes not a moment too soon for Biosphere 2. Even Hollywood has now gotten into the act of lampooning the project with a new Polly Shore movie called Biodome. Just because we're stuck in a bubble doesn't mean we can't cause any trouble. It may be some time before Biospherians are sent back into the real biosphere. For now, Columbia is using the facility as a giant laboratory to study and teach environmental issues. The research that's conducted here really serves as the, the very best resource, even a backdrop uh, for teachers to teach environmental education, earth sciences, um, and help students learn how to be better steward, stewards of this planet. But will the Biosphere Project ever shake its reputation as a pseudo-scientific for-profit experiment that failed? Scientists are taking a wait-and-see approach. The fact that we have, you know, a bunch of very good and talented people becoming more and more involved with biosphere means that the credibility will increase but you know only time will tell you know whether or not this whole concept of doing experiments this way really has lasting value in any case one thing seems certain the biosphere will remain one of the most unusual tourist attractions in the arizona desert mark bernheimer for cnn reporting Many scientists say, in principle, the biosphere is an excellent place to test their theories of how the Earth's various ecosystems are interrelated. At Narita Airport, passengers and flight crews reported seeing the objects streaking across the sky. And at least one lucky cameraman was in the right place at the right time. The remains of the meteorite were found about 60 miles northwest of Tokyo. All that was left weighed just over two ounces and was about the size and shape of half an egg. The Space Shuttle Endeavor lit up the pre-dawn sky at Florida's Kennedy Space Center this week. The launch of the first shuttle mission of the year came despite chilly weather and federal government furloughs. The six-man crew will spend nine days in orbit conducting two spacewalks. But their top priority is retrieval of a Japanese science satellite, which has been in orbit since last March. Among other things, it should provide scientists with insights on the weightless spawning habits of the Japanese red-bellied newt. On their way to that satellite, the shuttle Endeavour had to perform an evasive maneuver to avoid a dead Defense Department satellite. It's one of 7,000 objects which are tracked by U.S. Space Command in Colorado Springs, Colorado. On Friday, I got a chance to speak with some of Endeavour's crew members, and I asked them about that maneuver. You know, it wasn't any big deal for us. Um, there are a lot of things in orbit uh, in space. We uh, know where they are, and uh, it just so happened we were going to get uh, close enough to one to just make the uh, folks on the ground say if we just made a small maneuver we could avoid it completely and make it no problem so but we did that it was no big deal as it stands right now endeavor is scheduled to return to the kennedy space center for a night landing on january 20th even though the space flyer was our primary satellite to deploy and retrieve a second satellite the oast was equally exciting oast is the office of aeronautics and space technology satellite it consisted of four experiments which were really pretty much autonomous once we released it and you can see Koichi uh, working the arm here. Actually, you can see the arm, but Koichi is flying inside. He releases it, and it's going to go into uh, a pirouette maneuver to check its automatic uh, control system, its attitude control system. Now, when we were inside the shuttle, of course, we were thinking about how the satellite was going to perform, which is a very technical thing. It was only after I looked at the film afterward that I could reflect on really the majesty uh, of the satellite. And watch when the Earth comes into view at the lower left-hand side as the satellite uh, does its turn. Then you're going to see the sunlight hit it again, reflecting off of its gold coating. I think it's really something. Brett's flying the orbiter, Koichi's working the arm, Dan's taking pictures. Everybody's pretty busy inside, but I tell you, it was really an exciting time. We're backing away from this thing, and again, you're going to see a nice view of the Earth below. Incidentally, this picture of this deployment took place over the Namibian Desert in the southern part of the uh, African continent. And take a look at the clouds. Take a look at the synthetic object flying over the natural objects below. I think it was out of sight. With the robot arm of the U.S. Space Shuttle Endeavour, the Japanese astronaut extracted a NASA satellite from the Endeavour's cargo bay and released it into Earth orbit Sunday. The satellite containing scientific experiments will be collected again by the astronauts before they return to Earth on Saturday. The next, next task on the agenda is a spacewalk to test tools for building a space station. 
Earlier, the crew had a spectacular view of an unmanned rocket being launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida. Gnade Raum gehoben und dann im All ausgeklingt. Die Astronauten wollen ihn am Dienstag wieder einholen. Bis dahin soll der Satellit neue Ortungs- und Funksysteme testen und Schmutzpartikel untersuchen, die von der Raumfähre im All hinterlassen werden. Bereits gestern hatte die Endeavour einen japanischen Forschungssatelliten eingeholt. Here we are getting ready for the first of two EVAs. <coughs> Dan Barry is helping me getting into my lower torso assembly. And you can see that uh, in zero G, even getting in your EVA pants can be done two legs at a time. <laughs> and here we are about to come out on the first EVA. I'm uh, opening up the thermal cover and uh, taking my first peek outside. Uh, I was prepared for an awesome view, but <coughs> I didn't expect to uh, really get uh, what, I, what I got, which was a big 3D perspective because of all the, the peripheral vision uh, effects coming in. Here, Dan's saying, hey, let me out too. <laughs> On his feet. So you can <laughs> Thanks. Okay, we think uh, it's a good call, Dan. We should have the uh, end effector a roll so as to line the camera with the uh, cam that's aligned with the long axis of the Terra. I, I agree completely. Looks like a hardware misconfig. Right, Minuten haben diese beiden amerikanischen Astronauten der US-Raumfähre Endeavour Ausgang bekommen. Sechseinhalb Stunden lang sollen sie durch den Weltraum spazieren und dabei neu entwickelte Anzüge ausprobieren. Außerdem testen die Amerikaner Material, das für den Bau einer internationalen Raumstation Ende des Jahres verwendet werden soll. Knapp 310 Kilometer über der Erdoberfläche erprobten sie neue Raumanzüge sowie den Umgang mit Spezialwerkzeugen und einer Arbeitsplattform. Die Gerätschaften sollen nächstes Jahr beim Aufbau der internationalen Raumstation Alpha eingesetzt werden. Deutschland beteiligt sich an dem Projekt mit 1,2 Milliarden Mark. Leroy Chow and Daniel Barry ventured outside the shuttle to practice with new spacesuits and new construction techniques for building a future space station. Back on Earth, astronomers have been studying new clues to the evolution of the universe. Extraordinary pictures taken by the Hubble Space Telescope have been shown to the American Astronomical Society meeting in Texas. Experts say the tiny points of light and colored clouds show several hundred galaxies never seen before. Some of them may have been formed less than a billion years after the Big Bang, the gigantic explosion which many astronomers believe formed the universe containing our solar system. Here we are getting ready for the first of two EVAs. <clears throat> Dan Barry is helping me getting into my lower torso assembly. And you can see that uh, in zero G, even getting in your EVA pants can be done two legs at a time. <laughs> and here we are about to come out on the first EVA. I'm uh, opening up the thermal cover and uh, taking my first peek outside. Uh, I was prepared for an awesome view, but I didn't expect to uh, really get uh, what, I, what I got, which was a big 3D perspective because of all the, the peripheral vision uh, effects coming in. Here Dan's saying, hey, let me out too. <laughs> On his feet. So you can... <laughs> uh, the second rendezvous of the mission uh, to retrieve the Earth satellite went extremely well. Uh, as we closed inside of 600 feet, uh, Endeavour was on a nearly perfect trajectory uh, to achieve the rendezvous. Brian, the commander, must have been feeling really comfortable about the whole thing. Um, he figures it's safe enough to even let his PLT fly for a little bit. You notice the uh, expression on my face as I moved to the aft flight deck. Uh, it was a pretty exciting time for me to get a chance to fly the shuttle in uh, close proximity you know, to another spacecraft. Endeavour flies uh, extremely well. It's, it's, it's very stable. It flies even better than the simulators we have here at JSC. And very soon we were able to maneuver uh, OST within the grapple range of the robotic arm. The next view you're about to see is from the camera that's on the end of the robotic arm. It's the same view that Koichi is use, will use uh, to affect the capture of the satellite. And you'll watch, and once the satellite stabilizes, you'll see Koichi align the target on the satellite and then um, smoothly and quickly move in for the capture.
and just like that, the man was two for two, and uh, he very quickly had uh, two satellites uh, tucked safely in the tail of bay. His robotic arm to retrieve a second satellite earlier in the day. The NASA science probe spent two days free of the shuttle while collecting scientific data. On Saturday, Koichi had used the robotic arm to retrieve a Japanese satellite. On the ground, Mission Control is monitoring the shuttle's cooling system, which failed on Monday due to ice buildup. Uh, the second rendezvous of the mission uh, to retrieve the Earth satellite went extremely well. Uh, as we closed inside of 600 feet, uh, Endeavour was on a nearly perfect trajectory uh, to achieve the rendezvous. Brian, the commander, must have been feeling really comfortable about the whole thing. Um, he figures it's safe enough to even let his PLT fly for a little bit. You notice the uh, expression on my face as I moved to the aft flight deck. Uh, it was a pretty exciting time for me to get a chance to fly the shuttle in uh, close proximity you know, to another spacecraft. Endeavour flies uh, extremely well. It's, it's, it's very stable. It flies even better than the simulators we have here at JSC. And very soon we were able to maneuver uh, OST within the grapple range of the robotic arm. The next view you're about to see is from the camera that's on the end of the robotic arm. It's the same view that Koichi is use, will use uh, to affect the capture of the satellite. And you'll watch, and once the satellite stabilizes, you'll see Koichi align the target on the satellite and then um, smoothly and quickly move in for the capture. And just like that, the man was two for two, and uh, he very quickly had uh, two satellites uh, tucked safely in the tail of bay. Now, EVA-2, like EVA-1, was six hours and 50-something minutes worth of hardware-intensive EVA. We were evaluating all kinds of tools and techniques that might be used in uh, construction of a space station. Now, this looks like some kind of weird space exercise, but actually what I'm doing is imparting loads to the uh, task plate in which my feet are connected. The sensors in the bottom of that plate that will sense the loads and make recordings of that load's data. As I said, it was hardware intensive. We had electronic cuff checklists, power tools, rigid umbilicals, electrical fluid line connectors, uh, electrical connectors, fluid line connectors, improved helmet lights, you name it, we had it. We had stuff hanging off of us everywhere. We could set off metal detectors from orbit. <laughs> now, one of the highlights of this uh, EVA was billed to be a thermal evaluation to test improvements to the suit, but it's time for the truth to come out. The truth is that I was a bad boy, and I was told to go stand in the corner. So I stood in the corner and got cold all morning. I stood in the corner and got cold all afternoon. And I stood in the corner, and I got cold all night, and nobody would come out and play with me. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, the thermal evaluation worked extremely well, and I think we've got a good suit and ready to go build the space station. Here we are at the end of the second EVA. And while I wait for Winston to uh, button up his slide wire, I've kind of climbed up the bulkhead and taken a peek inside to see what the guys inside are doing. And here we are coming in and uh, closing up the thermal cover and getting ready for the repress for the last time. Need to give that thing a good slam. <laughs> Bei ihrem Weltraumspaziergang testeten die beiden Astronauten neue Spezialanzüge. Dabei gab es erste Probleme schon beim Ankleiden. Ihr Ausflug begann mit einstündiger Verspätung. Zum Schutz vor Temperaturen von bis zu minus 73 Grad Celsius trugen die Astronauten beheizbare Stiefel und Handschuhe. Außerdem überprüften die Astronauten verschiedene Werkzeuge und Materialien. Diese sollen beim Bau einer internationalen Weltraumstation im nächsten Jahr zum Einsatz kommen. Spacewalk, probably a little before it. He told crewmates that the suit was toasty inside. NASA says the temperatures may not have really reached the 100 degrees below zero Fahrenheit as they had expected. This suit is designed to allow astronauts to spend more time in space when construction of the space station is to begin in 1997.
Zwei Astronauten der US-Raumfähre Endeavour probierten sechs Stunden lang neu entwickelte Kälteschutzanzüge aus. Die heizbaren Handschuhe und Thermostiefel machten den Aufenthalt in der Ladebucht erträglich, bei einer Temperatur von minus 73 Grad. Das Urteil der Weltraumspaziergänger kalt, aber nicht unangenehm. California researchers discovered the two new planets about 35 light years from Earth. One orbits a star in the constellation Virgo. The other is in the Big Dipper. San Francisco State University astronomers Jeffrey Marcy and Paul Butler say the discoveries are only the tip of the planetary iceberg. We're seeing the big guys, but this sort of implies that there are many, many, many more small guys, uh, maybe guys like the Earth. Butler and Marcy are particularly excited because the temperature on one of the planets is thought to be 185 degrees Fahrenheit. That's cool enough for complex molecules to exist and possibly life. What we need now are chemists who are good with organic chemistry, atmospheric phys physics, meteorology. The chemists need to bring all these fields to bear and ask the theoretical question, would indeed life form in the presence of the atmosphere and surfaces of these planets we found. Just last fall, Swiss astronomers found the first planet outside our solar system, and there are signs from observations using the Hubble Space Telescope of another planet orbiting a star known as Beta Pictoris. Uh, this is really the first time we've seen something that could, look, could be very like our own solar system. While the astronomers believe these planets are there, they haven't actually seen them. Instead, they infer their existence by looking for stars that wobble. And it turns out that a star orbited by a planet will wobble in space due to the gravitational pull of the planet as the planet goes around. It's sort of like if you had a bowling ball on the end of a string and you slung that bowling ball around, your body would naturally wobble as you're being tugged on by the bowling ball. Scientists attending the American Astronomical Society meeting in San Antonio also got their first look at never-before-seen galaxies deep in the universe, courtesy of the Hubble telescope. NASA Administrator Dan Golden said the space agency is committed to developing new telescopes, satellites, sensors, and probes to explore the universe over the next quarter century. In the meantime, some astronomers have a more immediate project. Astronomers believe there are more planets in the universe yet to be found. U.S. astronomers are currently in a race with the Swiss to see who can find them first. Tony Clark, CNN, San Antonio. After two rendezvous, a deploy, two successful EVAs on Flight Day 8, we had some time to appreciate the beautiful views of the Earth, to take some film to bring back to show you all the depth of the colors and the, the beauty from, from our perspective. We also did some carefully controlled fluid dynamics experiments. <laughs> the commander said, you better get that and not make a mess of my orbiter. <laughs> Splattering coffee on the wall was an automatic airlock depress. <laughs> Koichi and I also had an opportunity to play the ancient oriental uh, game of Go, and uh, we brought this, this along with us really to symbolize connections between past and present and between Japan and the United States. We could also experience how our body reacts to different kinds of motions in microgravity. As you can see, my smile decreases as spin goes on. <laughs> Here's the master of karate, Winston Scott. Look how stable his motions are even though his feet are not attached to the floor. <laughs> It's uh, customary in Japan to mark the beginning and end of a large project by filling in the eyes of a Daruma doll. We had already filled in the eye of this Daruma to start the project, and here Koichi and I are getting ready after the retrieval of the SFU to uh, mark the completion of the project. One of the hardest things to do is to say goodbye to a view like this when it's time to come home. Uh, we all took our last gazes, uh, closed the payload bay doors, got in our suits, got ready for the deorbit burn. We burn. And Eva has been in space nine days. Two of those days were devoted to spacewalks to help astronauts get ready for the building of a space station next year. Weather permitting, Endeavour is scheduled to land just over one hour from now at 7.42 GMT and will bring you live coverage of the landing when it occurs.
And that's World News for now. I'm Bettina Lucia. Thank you for joining us. World Business This Week is coming up next. of a live event. Hello, I'm Bettina Lucia. We interrupt Earth Matters to bring you live the landing of the Space Shuttle Endeavour. The shuttle with six astronauts aboard is making a rare nighttime landing at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And you can see now the live pictures coming in. There's the shuttle approaching, coming closer, still very high in the sky from what we know. Among the highlights of this nine-day mission were two spacewalks. There was one Japanese astronaut on board uh, the space shuttle, Koichi Wakata. And uh, with the help of a robot, uh, he captured a Japanese satellite. That Japanese satellite is now on board of the space shuttle. And they later also used a robot arm to launch and recapture a second satellite that's also on board of the Endeavour. The shuttle commander, Brent Jett, said Friday this mission was extremely successful, that it was a good training mission for the International Space Station that uh, will be started to be built next fall. It's a very expensive project, as you might know, four billion dollars at least. Several countries will participate. And uh, NASA and the crew felt that this mission, this trip, was a perfect training exercise. One of the other things that has been going on in the last several days were uh, the spacewalks where the astronauts tested uh, new space suits that could uh, weather the extremely cold temperatures outside in space. Uh, the temperatures outside of the Endeavour when those spacewalks happened were 70 degrees Celsius minus and uh, one of the astronauts was quoted later as saying it felt rather cozy so they apparently were working it was warm enough and uh, that's also very important for the space station that will uh, be built uh, over the next several years. Again, a nighttime landing is very rare. The reason that they had to do all that was uh, uh, dictated by the course that the shuttle had to follow in chasing down the Japanese satellite. That's why they are coming in at uh, around 2.40 uh, local time, 2.40 in the middle of the night in uh, Florida on the east coast of the United States. You see the live pictures coming in to us right now. NASA is uh, quite proud of its program and of course they always provide us live pictures so we can show them around the world because they want to make sure that people keep on supporting the shuttle missions. Uh, the capturing the Japanese satellite was the uh, number one priority for this uh, mission. Uh, the Japanese space program paid NASA about 65 million dollars for this pickup and delivery. And you can see the pictures there coming in live. Endeavour will land on a brightly lit runway at the Kennedy Space Center near Cape Canaveral. And this is an important uh, mission for Endeavour. As you know, uh, this month's, uh, it's the 10th anniversary of the uh, Challenger disaster that happened 10 years ago when the shuttle Challenger blew up right after liftoff. The shuttle program was delayed for some three years. Uh, NASA was trying to find uh, out how it could improve the safety of these missions. And it's also interesting because uh, the Challenger accident happened in very cold weather. You're seeing it now, Endeavour coming in here, Kennedy Space Center live pictures. There's the runway, brightly lit. It's still obviously very dark. and. Here it is, Shuttle Endeavour coming down and here's the touchdown. Perfect mission, nine day mission, NASA is proud saying this was a perfect exercise. The six astronauts, one Amer uh, six, five Americans and one Japanese are safely back home. 
having concluded this mission, and you can see there's some kind of parachute in the back to help Endeavour to slow down. And whenever astronauts come back, they will go long series of tests to see how they uh, weathered this very, very special trip into outer, outer space. Of course, it's, there's a certain routine to all of this by now. See the pretty picture here, and ever slowly coming up. So that was it. The space shuttle has landed. Endeavour is safely back home. And that concludes our special report. And we rejoin now Earth Matters already in progress. I'm Bettina Lüscher. Thank you for watching. This has been a CNN Live event. We touched down about 2.40 in the morning, I imagine. We broke a few folks up there in Florida with the sonic booms as we came in. Uh, as soon as the mains were down, Brent put the drag chute out, and that, that's our major deceleration device uh, during the, the rollout. Uh, at about 60 knots, he jettisoned it here, and if you'll notice, it falls pretty much straight behind the orbiter, so there wasn't much crosswind that day. And as we roll down the runway, we have those uh, bright lights behind us. You know, watch me searching for the uh, center line here. Watch the nose move left and right. Uh, we were about two miles away from those lights, and it was starting to get dark down there. And it's real important that you stop on the center line. It's the most, <laughs> most important part of the mission. Nach zehn Tagen im All ist die US-Raumfähre auf die Erde zurückgekehrt. Die sechs Astronauten testeten auf ihrer Expedition die Tauglichkeit von speziellem Material und Werkzeug zum Bau einer internationalen Weltraumstation. Zum größten Erfolg zählte hier das Einfangen eines japanischen Satelliten mit Hilfe eines Roboterarms. Mit dem Bau der Station kann nun bereits Ende nächsten Jahres begonnen werden. Außer den USA nehmen auch Kanada, Japan, Russland und die Europäische Union teil. It was a dark but safe homecoming for the Space Shuttle Endeavour. In Florida, the Endeavour and its crew glided in for a rare night landing at 2.42 a.m. local time Saturday. While on its nine-day mission, the crew retrieved a Japanese science satellite and conducted two spacewalks. The crew also tested heated spacesuits and experimented with construction techniques to be used on building space stations. The shuttle Columbia is due to fly next in late February. The American Raumfahrer Endeavour is wieder auf der Erde. Mit einer rauen, aber sicheren Landung setzte sie in der Nacht im mit Flutlicht erleuchteten Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral auf. Es war das achte Mal bei den insgesamt 74 NASA-Missionen, dass ein Shuttle in der Dunkelheit landete. Die Endeavour brachte einen japanischen Satelliten zurück, der fast ein Jahr lang im Orbit war. Neun Tage war die Crew von Commander Brian Duffy im All beschäftigt mit dem Einfangen von Satelliten und Weltraumspaziergängen. In nur einer Nacht sprangen die Temperaturen an der Ostküste über den Gefrierpunkt auf plus 15 Grad. Die ungeheuren Schneemassen der vergangenen Wochen fingen an zu schmelzen und das Wasser überflutet jetzt alles, was sich in den Weg stellt. Regenfälle und ein Orkan lassen den Pegel weiter steigen. Vor Rhode Island drückte ein Sturm einen Tanker auf eine Sandbank. Das Schiff mit 15 Millionen Liter Heizöl an Bord drohte in den bis zu 6 Meter hohen Wellen zu zerbrechen. Während die Küste mit den Fluten kämpft, erstarrt der Norden und Mittelwesten im Frost. Bei Temperaturen bis minus 62 Grad wurden Schulen und Flughäfen geschlossen. Die Blizzards erreichen Windgeschwindigkeiten von 100 Stundenkilometern. Im mittleren Westen der Vereinigten Staaten gab es ein Schneechaos und dafür sorgte dieser Wirbel, der mit den Schneemassen auch noch arktische Kaltluft weit nach Süden transportierte. Und dabei stürzte stellenweise die Temperatur innerhalb von zwei Stunden um 20 Grad. Und gleichzeitig wurde an der Ostküste sehr warme Luft nach Norden transportiert. Dort ist ja letzte Woche ein Blizzard drüber gezogen mit enormen Schneemassen. Und dieser Schnee, der schmolz natürlich jetzt bei diesen Temperaturen. Und da dieser Wirbel auch noch sehr schnell nach Osten zog, wurde dabei mit diesen Wolken auch noch Regen herangebracht. Und der ließ den Schnee jetzt noch schneller schmelzen. Hochwasser war die Folge, viele Straßen mussten gesperrt werden und Brücken wurden weggerissen. Wie, äh, wie es dort zugeht, das zeigt die Temperaturverteilung auf weniger als 500 Kilometer Entfernung, ein Unterschied von 29 Grad. Und wo da Kalt- und Warmluft aufeinander prallen, geht es natürlich ordentlich zur Sache. Kräftige Gewitter waren die Folge. 
Hier unten in Florida war es im Norden Floridas gestern nur 18 Grad warm, heute nur noch 1 Grad. Und in Key West machten sich zwar die Wolken der Kaltluft bemerkbar, aber bei 23 Grad konnte man noch schön seinen Wasserspielen nachgehen. Ja, warum diese äh, extremen Wetterlagen in Nordamerika? Das liegt einmal an den nordsüdlich orientierten Rocky Mountains und an den riesigen Weiten des Mittleren Westens. Die Tiefdruckgebiete vom Pazifik müssen entweder den Umweg über den Norden oder über den Süden nehmen. Und dann haben sie eben über den Mittleren Westen freie Fahrt, sowohl von der Warmluft nach Norden als auch von der Kaltluft nach Süden. Würden wir bei uns die Alpen abtragen, in Nord-Süd-Richtung über Großbritannien und Frankreich wieder aufbauen, dann hätten wir genau solche extremen Wetterlagen. Seien wir froh, dass die Alpen dort sind, wo sie sind. Freuen uns daran, dass wir jetzt dort die Sonne genießen können, auch wenn die Schneeverhältnisse nicht besonders sind. Ihnen einen schönen Abend, angenehmen Sonntag. Tschüss. A pair of spacewalks went off without a hitch. Astronauts Leroy Chow, Dan Barry and Winston Scott got a chance to test tools, techniques and equipment, which might be used to build the International Space Station. Scott also chilled out in the 100 degree below zero shadow of the shuttle to further test thermal improvements to NASA's spacesuits. Scott says he stayed comfortably warm. The astronauts also successfully plucked a Japanese satellite from orbit, which will ride home with them. From low Earth orbit to the outer fringes of the universe, astronomers may be closer than ever to answering a fundamental question which humans have pondered since the beginning. Are we alone in the universe? Tony Clark was there as scientists announced the discovery of two planets which could possibly harbor water and maybe, just maybe, some form of life. California researchers discovered the two new planets about 35 light years from Earth. One orbits a star in the constellation Virgo. The other is in the Big Dipper. San Francisco State University astronomers Jeffrey Marcy and Paul Butler say the discoveries are only the tip of the planetary iceberg. We're seeing the big guys, but this sort of implies that there are many, many, many more small guys, uh, maybe guys like the Earth. Butler and Marcy are particularly excited because the temperature on one of the planets is thought to be 185 degrees Fahrenheit. That's cool enough for complex molecules to exist and possibly life. What we need now are chemists who are good with organic chemistry, atmospheric phys physics, meteorology, the chemists need to bring all these fields to bear and ask the theoretical question, would indeed life form in the presence of the atmosphere and surfaces of these planets we found? Just last fall, Swiss astronomers found the first planet outside our solar system, and there are signs from observations using the Hubble Space Telescope of another planet orbiting a star known as Beta Pictoris. Uh, this is really the first time we've seen something that could, look, could be very like our own solar system. While the astronomers believe these planets are there, they haven't actually seen them. Instead, they infer their existence by looking for stars that wobble. And it turns out that a star orbited by a planet will wobble in space due to the gravitational pull of the planet as the planet goes around. It's sort of like if you had a bowling ball on the end of a string and you slung that bowling ball around, your body would naturally wobble as you're being tugged on by the bowling ball. Scientists attending the American Astronomical Society meeting in San Antonio also got their first look at never-before-seen galaxies deep in the universe, courtesy of the Hubble telescope. Astronomers believe there are more planets in the universe yet to be found. U.S. astronomers are currently in a race with the Swiss to see who can find them first. Tony Clark, CNN. San Antonio. Scientists are painstakingly piecing together a new picture of Jupiter. The U.S. space agency NASA is releasing the first look inside the giant planet and its volatile atmosphere. The information was sent back by the suicide probe from the Galileo spacecraft. CNN's Greg Lefebvre has been monitoring the project. He joins us now from NASA's Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California. Greg, can you tell us about the mission and, and what they found out? Well, I'll tell you, the mission has proven to be a huge boon for the scientific studies. Uh, this is a great day for science. We know a lot more about Jupiter than we ever did, and with that, we know more about how this solar system was formed. For example, uh, on Jupiter, we're finding virtually no water. This is a very, very dry planet, something scientists were not expecting to find out. They say that other planets in the solar system have lost their, uh, their water and lost much of their gases uh, in the early stages 
stages of their existence, not so with Jupiter. And now when, when these pro this probe went down into Jupiter, they found extremely high winds, which they did not expect. They found that this planet uh, generates a tremendous amount of energy from within. It gives off twice the heat that it takes in from the sun. This is new information, and it tells them a lot about Jovian weather, the Jupiter's weather, if you will. It is also telling us that two new planets that were discovered only last month outside this solar system look to be much like Jupiter, and that is telling scientists that they will know more about how the universe was formed and how our solar system was formed, and perhaps what it will look like in the decades and the centuries and the eons to come. This is Greg Lefebvre, CNN, reporting live from Mountain View, California. Greg, thanks very much. The Jupiter mission blasted off in 1989, then zoomed through space for six years, often silent, dormant, before exploding with information last month. When it arrived at Jupiter last July, the craft separated into two. The probe began preparing for its descent into the atmosphere, while the relay unit stayed in orbit. The Jupiter mission cost one and a half billion dollars. It became the most ambitious interplanetary undertaking in the history of spaceflight. On December 7th, the probe slammed into Jupiter's atmosphere, sending up information on gases, temperature, electrical charges, and atmospheric pressure. Then the pressure and heat destroyed the probe. After six years of travel, the plunge took just an hour. But as scientists found when the orbiter relayed the information back to an anxious Earth, it was an hour stuffed with discoveries. A few days later, scientists learned how rich that information was. The scientific triumph came after two heart-stopping, almost mission-killing failures. The main antenna would not open, so a quick software rewrite got the data crammed into a tiny backup antenna. And last October, the craft's data recorder got stuck on rewind. Another software rewrite telling the craft, never do that again. Greg Lefebvre, CNN, Mountain View, California. Information from Galileo's plunge into Jupiter may solve an old mystery. Is Jupiter really a planet? Or, as some believe, a tiny dark star stuck orbiting our sun? Uh, in the case of Jupiter, it's such a massive planet that it's retained everything it formed with, basically. And so that's why we think it represents the early conditions in the solar system. At nearly every turn, the scientists got information they did not expect. Discovery. Jupiter is an extremely dry planet. One-third to one-tenth the water content expected. That relationship between hydrogen and helium is much different than expected. It changes how scientists look at how the planet was formed and how the universe was formed. And I think this helium business on Jupiter tells us Jupiter is changing. It is not made five, four billion years ago and since then sitting there on the sky and nothing happens. It is changing in a dramatic way. Another new discovery, the lightning seen by the Voyager space probe that passed years ago did not happen this time, changing the view of the planet's electrical current. Discovery, Jupiter's atmosphere is rocked by extremely high winds, clocked over 330 miles per hour, 50% faster than believed. Launched in 1989, the probe spent six years traveling to Jupiter. Last month, the probe plunged into Jupiter's atmosphere, sending back 58 minutes of measurements. The richness of the data will allow scientists to add facts to their theories and perhaps change some of those theories. Aspects of the theories that we've been living with are going to have to be modified uh, as a result of these uh, new findings. Another astonishment is the near perfect operation of the equipment, some of which was designed a decade ago. But I think the probe worked very, very well. Um, and it, it was designed a long time ago. Of course, it was using predicted models of Jupiter. And it had to be designed to sit and wait a long time to get there. So it's very exciting to see that the probe uh, really worked as well as it did. The probe was destroyed in the plunge, but the orbiter lives on. It will circle Jupiter, sending back information about its atmosphere. It will also study four of Jupiter's moons. Greg Lefebvre, CNN, Mountain View, California. Galileo performed like a champ, but spacecraft like it are on the way out. When we come back, we'll find out what NASA has in mind for planetary exploration in the 21st century. Stay with us.
20 years and more than $1.3 billion for NASA to bring off the Galileo mission to Jupiter. While scientists may feel data from the spacecraft is invaluable, it seems unlikely the U.S. Space Agency will plan another mission of that size. But NASA says that doesn't mean the glory days of space exploration are behind us. The key words for the future? Smaller, cheaper, faster. It is one of the last of a dying breed. Big, complex, comprehensive, and expensive, NASA's Galileo spacecraft is, in many ways, an artifact of a bygone era. But NASA Administrator Daniel Golden isn't lamenting. I think that the future for the spacecraft, space program, the planetary program especially, is so bright, but it's way ahead of us, but it's going to be a lot different than it used to be. Different indeed. By century's end, Golden envisions NASA launching an armada of unmanned science spacecraft at a rate of one a month. Planned missions to Mars, Pluto, the Moon, and to retrieve dust from a comet's tail call for simple, small probes with a narrow scientific focus. The concept flies in the face of NASA's old philosophy. Which was to put as much as you can on one spacecraft because it may be the last bus out of town. Uh, and so what we're trying to do now is know we're going to provide lots of buses out of town, but they're going to be minivans. Take the Mars Pathfinder mission, for example. Slated for launch at the end of this year, the 600-pound craft is designed to land on the surface of Mars in July of 97. A two-foot-long robot will venture out 30 feet, transmitting images of Martian soil and rocks. Budget for the mission, $150 million or about 15% of the cost of the billion-dollar Mars Observer. It was supposed to enter the orbit of the Red Planet in August of 93, but was lost, apparently after a fuel line burst. But not everyone agrees with this new approach to unmanned space exploration. As some NASA critics point out, in space science, quantity doesn't always equate with quality. And for many of these missions, bigger may in fact be better. NASA scientist Torrance Johnson has worked on the Galileo project since the beginning. He knows if NASA was planning a similar mission today, Galileo's instruments and probe would probably be divvied up and launched on three separate spacecraft. Johnson believes that might have diminished the scientific payoff. He just sent one probe there, measured one set of things, and then several years went, went by and he went back with another probe and measured another set of things. You'd never be able to put the whole picture together. But NASA administrators insist new technology will make it possible to do more for less. So when the sun sets on Galileo and the era of big unmanned missions, planetary scientists are hoping they won't be left in the dark. It's time for us to turn out the lights here. Thanks for joining us. I'm Miles O'Brien. Ten years ago, seven astronauts perished when the U.S. space shuttle Challenger exploded seconds after liftoff. As CNN's John Zarella reports, NASA has come a long way since then, but the agency's awakening came at a terrible price. For years now, Bruce Jarvis and his wife Ellen have worn out many shoes, walking shopping center parking lots. They look for cars bearing Florida's Challenger license plates. It's the only way we have of thanking the people who buy those plates. A small card placed in the driver's window says thank you to those who are helping support space education programs by buying the plates. Ten years ago, on a bitterly cold Florida morning, the Jarvises watched as their eldest son Greg and six other astronauts died. I knew what had happened immediately. I, I knew that that was the end of the group. Um, I knew that, that nobody would come out of that one. My brain just wouldn't accept that that happened. I thought that they could be rescued. I thought they were in a self-contained unit, that if they looked hard enough, they could find and be rescued. Ultimately, the space agency itself had to be rescued. The accident, a special investigative committee found, was caused by a failed O-ring seal. But the more serious flaw was with NASA itself. The agency believed it could do no wrong. It was above failure. A system that wasn't working the way it should became accepted as, as something that you could continue to fly. And so I think it was an accumulation of, of self-deceptions that ultimately resulted in, in 
the one last horrible mistake. A mistake that on that January morning, NASA was ill-prepared to cope with. Veteran space reporter Howard Benedict remembers. The general NASA public affairs people did not want this way, but it came from on high. Shut up. Don't tell him anything. They just weren't used to dealing with a disaster. The wreckage of Challenger pulled from the ocean floor was symbolic of the state of NASA a decade ago. Since then, the space agency has been committed to rebuilding itself. Safer flight and ground systems, stricter launch and flight rules. We have launched the shuttle now twice as many times after Challenger as we did before the accident. We know the system. We've addressed the major problems uh, that were in the system at the time of the accident. And so I think the overall the shuttle is a much safer, much more uh, uh, usable system than it was a decade ago. But today's NASA continues paying the price for the arrogance of the past. Congress remains wary. There's little support from the White House. The space budget is constantly being squeezed, and the only long-term goal for humans in space is the International Space Station. These days, NASA's biggest challenge is keeping the dream alive until the fires of exploration are rekindled. The best thing we can do to remember and honor that crew is to get on with what the reasons they went into space anyway, which is to, to develop space to be used by the people on Earth. I probably will talk about the, um, the payload bay and talk about the satellites that are deployed. Krista McAuliffe, who was to be the be first teacher in space, said Challenger would be the ultimate field trip. So teacher Barbara way. Morgan, who was McAuliffe's Everything backup, happened. to this day stays ready to fulfill Krista's dream. Morgan believes it must be done for the children. And we've got to keep their future open and those opportunities out there for them and help them prepare for that. So, um, yes, we go on. And Bruce and Ellen Jarvis continue in their way keeping their son's dream alive, despite the pains of age and a decade of sorrow. He just said, he, I just want to call you to tell you that we're, the, the uh, thing will be going off tomorrow morning. And, uh, uh, and the last thing he said was, I love you, Dad. <laughs> John Zarella, CNN, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Weltweit verfolgten an den Bildschirmen wie die Raumfähre Challenger Sekunden nach dem Start in der Luft explodierte. Die Besatzung, zwei Frauen und fünf Männer, kam damals ums Leben. Cape Canaveral am 28. Januar 1986. Gespannt verfolgt die amerikanische Nation den 25. Shuttle-Start. Nach mehreren Startverschiebungen hebt die Challenger um 11.39 Uhr Ortszeit ab. Alle Systeme funktionieren normal. Doch nach 73 Sekunden die Katastrophe. In einer Höhe von 14 Kilometern explodieren 2 Millionen Liter Sauer- und Wasserstoff. Die Challenger verwandelt sich in einen weiß-roten Feuerball. Die Zuschauer, die den Start von der Tribüne aus verfolgen, sind fassungslos. Im Kontrollzentrum von Houston weiß sofort jeder, für die Astronauten gibt es keine Überlebenschance. Kein Ereignis seit der Ermordung von John F. Kennedy hat die Amerikaner so geschockt wie das Challenger-Unglück. Der amerikanische Traum von Triumph und Technik war geplatzt. Der damalige US-Präsident Reagan spricht in einer Rede zur Nation von einer Katastrophe für die Amerikaner. Dabei hätte sie verhindert werden können. Die Untersuchung ergab, schadhafte Dichtungsringe, die bei zu kaltem Wetter Gase entweichen ließen, waren verantwortlich. Ingenieure hatten immer wieder davor gewarnt. Doch das ehrgeizige Raumfahrtprogramm erstickte alle Proteste. Heute nach zehn Jahren hat sich die NASA zwar immer noch nicht von diesem Desaster erholt, aber sie hat wieder neuen Mut geschöpft, um die Eroberung des Weltraums voranzutreiben. Challenger Astronauts, but others who have died in the space program, the other astronauts, including uh, those who died in the Apollo 1 fire many, many years ago. As a matter of fact, it was 29 years ago yesterday when that incident occurred. And of course, then two years later, man was on the moon. The space program has certainly changed in the past 10 years. NASA has gone to great lengths to make the program better, to make the space shuttle safer, but still they always caution another accident could happen. Uh, although it is a safer vehicle today than it was, the cost to make it safer was a terrible price to pay. Tomorrow at NASA centers all across the United States, a moment of silence. Uh, that will be observed. It'll be 73 seconds of silence, and that, of course, is the length of time 
that uh, from the time of liftoff to the time of the explosion uh, over the Kennedy Space Center here. There will also be a missing man formation, T-38s piloted by astronauts uh, here at the Kennedy Space Center at 11.38 a.m., which is uh, the time the Challenger lifted off. Relitza? Thank you, John. CNN's John Zarella joined us live from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. 28. Januar 1986. Ein frostiger Morgen in Florida. Der Countdown läuft. 7, 6. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1. And liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission and it has cleared the tower. Gegen 11 Uhr Ortszeit hebt die Raumfähre Challenger mit sieben Astronauten an Bord vom Raumfahrtzentrum Cape Canaveral ab. Kaum 73 Sekunden später, in 14.300 Metern Höhe über dem Atlantik, explodiert das Raumschiff in einem riesigen Feuerball. Auf der Zuschauertribüne Angehörige der Astronauten und Gäste. Zunächst scheinen sie nicht zu begreifen, was sich vor ihren Augen ereignet. Eine anonyme Stimme aus dem Raumfahrtzentrum verkündet über Lautsprecher. Offenbar eine größere Fehlfunktion, blankes Entsetzen und Fassungslosigkeit auf den Gesichtern der Zuschauer. Die größte Fehlfunktion entpuppt sich als die schlimmste Katastrophe in der Geschichte der bemannten Raumfahrt. Drei Monate nach dem Unglück werden die sterblichen Überreste der sieben Astronauten aus dem Atlantik geborgen. Noch länger dauert es, bis die von Präsident Reagan eingesetzte Untersuchungskommission mit ersten Ergebnissen aufwartet. Die Dichtungsringe an der rechten der beiden Zusatzraketen hatten versagt und leicht entzündliche Gase freigesetzt. Das Material war durch Kälte und Frost brüchig geworden. Doch das war nicht alles. Die Kommission kam zu dem Schluss, dass die NASA trotz Warnungen Risiken fahrlässig in Kauf genommen hatte. In seiner Trauerrede meinte US-Präsident Reagan, die Zukunft gebe es nicht umsonst. Sieben Menschenleben hat das Experiment gekostet. Und aus dem Studio in Washington ist nun unser Korrespondent Roger Onet zugeschaltet. Guten Abend. Nahm nach Berlin. Heute vor zehn Jahren die Challenger-Tragödie. In welcher Form hat denn dieses Ereignis in den USA heute noch eine Rolle gespielt? Nun, es gibt keine Zeitung in diesem Lande, es gibt keine Fernsehsendung, die nicht darüber berichtet hat. Man hat Interviews mit den Angehörigen gemacht, man hat versucht nachvollziehen, wie sie diesen Schock im Laufe der Jahre überwunden haben oder wie die Eindrücke noch heute ihr Leben beeinflussen. All dies lebte hier in den Medien wieder auf. Nach der Explosion sind ja die Mittel für die bemannte Raumfahrt gekürzt worden. Welche Rolle spielen denn Raumfahrt und NASA heute noch? Nun, man muss zunächst einmal feststellen, dass es ja auch eine politische Veränderung gegeben hat. Damals sprach man noch über Star Wars, über das Programm, was sehr viel Geld kosten sollte. Inzwischen gibt es eine Kooperation mit Russland und es hat sich geändert. Damals hatte man noch Geld, heute haben beide Nationen kein Geld mehr und mit dem Wenigen, was man hat, versucht man zu kooperieren. Äh, man spricht hier in den USA sehr viel über einen ausgeglichenen Haushalt. Sollte er jemals erreicht werden, was viele bezweifeln, würde dies natürlich auch eine weitere Verknappung der Mittel bei der NASA bedeuten. Also, die Forschung geht weiter, aber Gemach, Gemach. Vielen Dank für diese Informationen aus Washington, Roger Onet. C'était il y a tout juste dix ans, le plus mauvais souvenir de l'histoire de la conquête spatiale. 72 secondes après son envol, la navette Challenger explose. À bord, sept membres d'équipage, dont une jeune institutrice, Christina McAuliffe, la première astronaute civile jamais envoyée dans l'espace. Christina McAuliffe a fait rêver les états unis et le monde entier, un rêve qui vire au cauchemar et qui anéantit l'image de la NASA. L'explosion de Challenger a d'ailleurs considérablement ralenti le programme spatial américain. Depuis dix ans, la NASA a bien sûr poursuivi ses recherches et a beaucoup progressé au niveau de la technique et de la sécurité, mais elle n'a jamais retrouvé son aura ternie depuis lors. Même si d'autres navettes ont remplacé Challenger, 
Même si le télescope Hubble et la sonde Galiléo autour de Jupiter sont des succès, la NASA n'a plus la confiance des Américains. Elle a même désormais beaucoup de mal à boucler son budget et négocie péniblement les fonds nécessaires à la future station spatiale construite en collaboration avec les Russes et les Européens. Wenige Sekunden nach dem Start explodierte die US-Raumfähre und riss die siebenköpfige Besatzung in den Tod. Seitdem hat sich in der amerikanischen Raumfahrt einiges geändert. Roswitha Lorenz blickt zurück. Cape Canaveral, 28. Januar 1986. Countdown für die US-Raumfähre Challenger. Ein Start wie aus dem Bilderbuch. 75 Sekunden später Horrorszenen über Florida. Bei einer Geschwindigkeit von gut 2300 Kilometern in der Stunde explodiert die Raumfähre, wird zum riesigen Feuerball. Für sieben Menschen, darunter zwei Frauen, endet der Weltraumtrip in einer tödlichen Katastrophe. Raumkapsel und Trümmerteile regnen Kilometer entfernt in den Atlantik. Der amerikanische Traum vom problemlosen Flug ins All zerplatzt an diesem Morgen. Vier Monate später steht fest, nicht nur defekte Dichtungsringe waren Ursache des Unglücks. Eine Untersuchungskommission listete einen ganzen Mängelkatalog bei der NASA auf. Fahrlässigkeit und Zeitdruck, der Start der Challenger war bereits mehrfach verschoben worden, standen dabei ganz oben auf der Liste. Ängstlich wurden alle Zukunftsprojekte auf Eis gelegt. Die US-Raumfahrtbehörde reagierte. Schärfere Sicherheits- und Qualitätskontrollen bestimmen den neuen Kurs der NASA. Heute sind fast alle amerikanischen Weltraumflüge unbemannt. Die Amerikaner setzen überwiegend auf internationale Zusammenarbeit. Das bringt in Zeiten verschärfter Rotstiftpolitik in Washington nicht nur Geld in die Kassen, sondern auch Dollars für teure Sicherheitsprojekte. 49 Mal starteten US-Raumfähren seit dem Challenger-Unglück vor zehn Jahren. Alle kehrten sie heil auf die Erde zurück. Trotzdem, die Boomindustrie Weltraum bleibt auch in Zukunft ein risikoreiches Unternehmen. Für die bemannte Raumfahrt ist es der schwärzeste Tag. Kurz nach dem Start explodiert der Raumgleiter Challenger über Cape Canaveral. Der Glaube an die Technik wurde damals erschüttert und der Schock sitzt auch zehn Jahre danach noch tief. Raumfahrtzentrum Cape Canaveral, 28. Januar 1986. 73 Sekunden nach dem Abheben explodiert die Challenger. Der Feuerball reißt sechs Astronauten und eine Lehrerin in den Tod. Es dauert weitere Sekunden oder Minuten, bevor jedem klar wird, dass das Spektakel eine Katastrophe ist. Der Albtraum vieler NASA-Mitarbeiter ist wahr geworden. Ich saß im Kontrollsaal hier in Washington. Wir schauten uns alle an zunächst. Wir haben also zunächst mal, ich würde sagen, eine halbe Stunde, eine Stunde gebraucht, als Individuen überhaupt zu uns zu kommen. Nach der Katastrophe wurde das ganze Sicherheitssystem überholt. Selbst kleinste Warnungen werden nun ernst genommen. 49 Flüge sind seitdem erfolgreich verlaufen. Und die NASA hat allen Grund, stolz zu sein. Doch solche Unfälle sind auch in Zukunft nicht völlig auszuschließen. Das Prinzip Hoffnung wird weiterhin jeden Shuttleflug begleiten. Auslandsjournal, die Themen. USA, zehn Jahre nach der Challenger-Explosion. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Willkommen zum Auslandsjournal. Echte Sensationen werden leicht übersehen, wahrscheinlich, weil nur ein paar Eingeweihte sie verstehen. So war das auch in der vergangenen Woche. Da funkte eine fliegende Kamera vom sogenannten Hubble-Weltraumteleskop Bilder zur Erde, die, wie Astronomen meinen, das menschliche Begreifen fast überfordern. Bilder vom Rande des Weltraums, die Prozesse zeigen, wie sie kurz nach dem Urknall abgelaufen sein könnten, kurz nach der Entstehung des Universums. Bei der Forschung im Weltall geht es nicht nur um Erkenntnisgewinn, viel häufiger um militärische, wirtschaftliche, technische Vorhaben. Vor zehn Jahren gab es dabei einen verheerenden Rückschlag. Kurz nach dem Start am 28. Januar 1986 explodierte die amerikanische Raumfähre Challenger. Alle sieben Astronauten kamen um. Die Ursache des Unglücks wurde gefunden, technische Mängel. Die bemannte Raumfahrt aber ging weiter. Unser USA-Korrespondent Elmar Thewissen. Sie sagen, es wird gut gehen. Das sind die Worte, die Commander Dick Scobie an diesem Morgen seinen Eltern am Telefon sagt. Es ist das letzte Mal, dass sie mit ihrem Sohn sprechen. 28. Januar 1986, morgens. Challenger hebt ab, trotz der Eiseskälte. 
Die Eltern von Christa McOlive haben Angst um ihre Tochter, die als erste Lehrerin im All für die Vision Weltraum werben soll. Booster Ignition and Liftoff of Endeavor. 11. Januar 1996. Wieder ist es eiskalt in Cape Canaveral. Wieder gibt es, wie bei fast allen der letzten 70 Shuttle-Missionen, Probleme, Startverzögerungen. Doch die Raumfähre Endeavor schafft es. Aber der amerikanische Traum vom Weltraum ist anders seit Challenger. Es ist 4 Uhr morgens im Johnson Space Center in Houston. Zur Arbeit kommt ein Mann, der bei jedem Start wie alle seine Kollegen an den Tag vor zehn Jahren denkt. Ed Campion war dabei. Es war, als würde man im Wuß der Gefühle ersticken, erinnert er sich. Der Schock, wie konnte das passieren? Wir haben versucht, unsere Gefühle zu betäuben, um durch diesen Tag zu kommen. Am nächsten hätten sich die meisten wohl am liebsten im Bett unter der Decke verkrochen. Aber irgendwie rafften sie sich auf, um die Ursache zu erforschen. Das war ein sehr schmerzhafter Vorgang. Die Kälte hatte Dichtungen an den Treibstoffraketen beschädigt. Wie gestern Abend bekannt wurde, entschied sich die NASA gegen die ausdrückliche Warnung zweier Techniker für den Start. Das Antriebsfeuer griff über. Die Astronauten überlebten vermutlich die Explosion. Das Cockpit war auch danach noch intakt. Doch die Schleudersitze hatte die NASA Monate zuvor wieder ausbauen lassen. Die Shuttle-Insassen starben möglicherweise beim Aufprall auf dem Wasser. Heute gilt für alle Visionen bei der NASA, sie müssen preisgünstig sein. Zwar gab es Geld für die Sicherheit der Astronauten, ansonsten aber wird gespart. Ein strafferes Management, einige Tausend der mehr als 21.000 Beschäftigten mussten gehen, vor allem weil der Kongress in Washington die Finanzen zusammenstrich. Das Shuttle-Programm wird zu teuer. Vor allem die Reparatur nach den Flügen wie hier am Hitzeschild treibt die jährlichen Kosten auf die Spitze. Rund 4 Milliarden Dollar, fast ein Drittel des NASA-Budgets. Zur unbekannten Größe scheint für einen NASA-Manager immer mehr die Finanzspritze aus Washington zu werden. Alan Ledwig entwarf vor zehn Jahren in einer Kommission all die Pläne mit, für die er heute kaum noch Geld hat. Also beschloss die NASA vor kurzem, das Space Shuttle-Programm zu privatisieren. Wir müssen die Kosten für den Transport in den Orbit senken, erklärt er, sonst ist im Weltraum kein Geschäft zu machen. Also Kostensenkung zum Beispiel durch eine Partnerschaft zwischen Regierung und Industrie. Die Vision. Der X-34, von NASA und Industrie zu gleichen Teilen finanziert, soll Satelliten in niedrige Umlaufbahnen bringen, den Konkurrenten aus Europa und China das Geschäft vermiesen. Sein großer Bruder, der X-33. Er soll der wahre Nachfolger des Shuttle werden, anders als er mit integrierten Treibstofftanks. Doch die NASA will nur bis zum erfolgreichen Test mitfinanzieren. Danach muss der Shuttle alleine fliegen, getragen vom Geld der Industrie. Ich bin sehr enttäuscht von der Industrie, klagt einer der Sparkommissare im Kongress. Wir haben bewiesen, dass so ein Shuttle-Programm funktioniert. Erst wollten sie mitmachen, aber wenn sie dann Risikokapital einsetzen sollen, dann spielen sie nicht mit. Parteifreunde von ihm würden die NASA am liebsten ganz privatisieren. Er könnte sich immerhin für den X-33 einen russischen Raketenantrieb vorstellen. Verrat denken manche bei der NASA, wie bei der Weltraumstation Alpha. Weil 100 Milliarden Dollar zu teuer waren, teilt sich die Politik Ruhm und Kosten jetzt außer mit der europäischen ESA, Kanada und Japan, auch mit Russland. Und manchen Abgeordneten im Kongress ist der amerikanische Anteil immer noch zu groß. Wir sind bei einem zu Besuch, der so etwas persönlich nimmt. John Glenn, jetzt Senator, war der erste Astronaut im Orbit. Wir wollen wissen, wo sie geblieben ist, die Vision, die ihn und andere damals in den Weltraum trieb. Es geht nicht darum, einen Mann in eine Büchse zu stecken, ihn dann so weit wie möglich hochzuschießen und wieder zurückzuholen. Nein, es geht um Grundsatzforschung da oben im Weltraumlabor und das sollten wir machen.
Also haben wir uns Nasas ehrgeizigstes Projekt näher angeschaut. Es hat, abgesehen vom etwas unterkühlten Aussehen, alles, was man braucht, um für Jahre im All zu bleiben. Eine für die Verhältnisse komfortable Schlafkammer, in der man seinen Kopf per Klettverschluss ans Kissen heftet. Auch das ist wichtig und weil für den Abfall eigentlich kein Platz ist, werden bestimmte Stoffe kurzerhand recycelt. Gewöhnungsbedürftig. Man zeigt uns das Paradebeispiel für den Nutzen der Station. In diesem Bioreaktor könnte man wegen der Schwerelosigkeit dreidimensionale Lebertransplantate züchten. An Bord könnte auch ein Mittel gegen Kalziummangel gefunden werden, der im All die Knochen der Astronauten erheblich schneller zerstört als auf der Erde. Ist das Problem gelöst, wäre die Weltraumstation Alpha vielleicht eine ideale Basis für jahrelange Reisen in die Tiefen des Alls. Das ist die Vision, die die NASA in ein paar Wochen offiziell bekannt geben wird. Wir wollen ein Bild von einem Planeten in einem anderen Sonnensystem innerhalb von 20 Jahren, sagt Alan Ledwig. Zehn Jahre Suche und dann ein Raumschiff hinschicken, das dort fotografiert. So wie es die Sonde Galileo schon beim Planeten Jupiter macht. Die Fotos der ausgesetzten Minisonde werden mit Spannung erwartet. Und die Meldung der letzten Woche, dass zwei Planeten entdeckt wurden, auf denen es vielleicht Leben gibt, hat die NASA elektrisiert. Nun träumt man vom Vorstoß in ferne Galaxien, wie sie das Hubble-Teleskop vor kurzem fotografierte. An die Grenzen des Machbaren lässt man sich da nur ungern erinnern, sei es der Geldmangel oder das Versagen, dem immerhin sieben Menschen zum Opfer fielen. On January the 28th, 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded shortly after liftoff, killing all seven astronauts on board. In focus this hour, a conversation with the wives of two of the astronauts who died. CNN Cynthia Bowers asked them to reflect on the tragedy. It's very difficult to see this explosion again and again because we all, my, my children and I love Mike so still that it is a painful memory. The children have grown up to remember the way their father lived and mostly I've tried to help them focus on that very point. We will get into that a little bit more later. June, for a long time, you, I understand, couldn't even talk about this. Um, why was that, and what helped you get over that? Well, for nearly nine years, Cynthia, I, every time a reporter asked me about that day, I, I couldn't even re remember. I didn't want to remember, much less talk about it. But uh, Robert Schuller, on a Sunday morning worship service, asked me to tell the, about my, our loss in that day, and um, I, when I couldn't. He said, then perhaps, June, you should write about it, and it can help you. So I wrote the story at, with his encouragement, and after I had finished the manuscript with my daughter's help, who is a writer, and gave me some encouragement, my son read the manuscript and encouraged its publication, and it has helped so. And, and I hope it can help others who are in a dark cloud sometime, if they can find a silver lining. Silver Linings is the name of the book. And um, it's three stories in one. It chronicles the events leading up to the Challenger accident and during and after. But it's more. It's a story of faith and it's a powerful love story as well. Knowing that the 10-year anniversary is coming up in just a few days, are you stealing yourself for the video popping up everywhere and it being almost unavoidable to watch again? Cynthia, it's difficult to, to see that video. I, I turn away from it. But what's even more sad is that the Challenger families came together to say to the nation, we, we know how they died. We want the world to know how they lived. And we created these Challenger centers. But now what we're discovering is that a new generation of youngsters are growing up and seven of them are my grandchildren. And they're asking the question about their granddad. And uh, I have a story for them and for any children who are watching that these people are angels today that they died serving their country, doing something they really loved, and they've gone on to a better place. And um, their mission continues to the Challenger Centers, and we believe that they were great pioneers, maybe not in a Conestoga wagon crossing the continent, making 
I, mean, I guess, trailblazing, forging the way for others, but they were space explorers. And um, they believed very much in what they were doing. And that's a part of history. So you, we have our private life with our loved ones, but they were also had a, very much a public life. And it's that public life that people are interested in and want to know. And it's a part of history. And they're beginning to become comfortable with understanding that it is history, but they're saddened that it's someone that they never got to meet. Well, June, I think uh, most Americans think of them as heroes in addition to the other things you mentioned. Let's um, quickly ask you about your Challenger Centers. I understand that you and the other families decided that a living memorial was better than just a piece of granite with some names on it. How do the Challenger Centers work and what, uh, what are they? Well, we have a network of 25 learning centers across the country. They started in Texas, California, New York, Florida, across Canada, Hawaii. At these centers, youngsters prepare to fly a mission into space, and their classroom teacher, school bus, climb aboard, a space station simulator, and a mission control mocked up much like NASA. These children in their classroom work together as a team solving problems, conducting scientific experiments, making important decisions, and they come away with great self-esteem. One day they were a navigator or they were a technician or an engineer or a scientist. And um, with this story, we're saying to the youngsters, this is how these people lived, and we want to provide an opportunity for them to learn science and math and have fun. So I always say, they take a trip, a field trip outside the boundaries of the planet and back home into their classroom textbooks to learn science and math. It sounds great. Jane, I know you're involved in that project too, but I want to ask you about the lawsuits. You filed a lawsuit against the government and against Morton Thiokol, who designed the O-rings. What happened in those lawsuits and was this a way of dealing with grief for you? Well, I always felt it was very important to find out uh, the problems behind the uh, explosion and the loss of our loved ones. We all made our own settlement, uh, out of court settlements, in our own ways, dealing with it as best we could. Um, part of the reason that I was interested in, and I never, uh, my suit with NASA was thrown out of the Supreme Court, so I never settled anything with NASA. I have many friends at NASA and have a great deal of respect for the space program and those that fly it in space and those dealing with this form of technology. My settlement was only with Martin Thiokol. I did not want, and I did not believe, and I still feel this way, that no corporation should benefit from the loss or the death of someone. That concludes our focus segment for this hour. Challenger 10 years later. As the U.S. reflects on its worst space disaster, NASA looks forward to the next generation of manned spacecraft. Hello and welcome. I'm Miles O'Brien. It's been 10 years this weekend since the space shuttle Challenger exploded 73 seconds after liftoff, killing all seven astronauts aboard. The worst disaster in the history of the U.S. space program the Challenger explosion ushered in the darkest chapter in NASA's history. This past week, the space agency released some chilling footage from the day of the explosion and the recovery mission that followed. John Zarella has the story. We have main engine start, four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Nothing appeared unusual when the shuttle Challenger left the launch pad. Roger, roll, Challenger. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. These re-released pictures from NASA show the men and women at Mission Control in Houston monitoring their consoles, the instrumentation. What they didn't see was the torch-like flame pouring from the solid rocket booster, burning a hole in the giant external fuel tank. Engines at 65 percent, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells. At one minute into the flight, the main engines are throttled up. Challenger, go and throttle up. Challenger, go and throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds, velocity 2,900 feet per second, altitude 9 nautical miles, downrange distance 7 nautical miles. 
Astronaut Dick Covey, capsule communicator, now sees what has happened. He's in shock, a feeling shared a thousand miles away at launch control at the Kennedy Space Center. It was a shock. Not so much disbelief, but because immediately it was obvious uh, from what you could see visually and looking at the information and the displays that uh, you had an explosion. Seconds went by like hours back at Mission Control. Flight GC, we've had uh, negative contact, lost the link. Okay, all operators, watch your data carefully. More nearly unbearable silence in the room, and agonizing time goes by. Then a report from RSO, range safety. Flight Fido, go ahead. RSO reports vehicle exploded. Did the RSOs have an impact point? Stand by. Reports from the flight dynamics officer indicate that the vehicle uh, apparently exploded and that uh, impact uh, in the water. Okay, are there any forces headed out that way? Yes, sir. DOD LSO reports that all, all soft forces have been scrambled and they are on their way. For weeks, Coast Guard and Navy vessels searched for wreckage. These underwater pictures show sections of the Challenger fuselage. Some debris was found floating on the surface. Steady, Bob. I got you. You got it? For months and months, pieces of Challenger were being found. And it was two and a half years before U.S. astronauts returned to space. John Zarella, CNN, reporting. The investigation following the incident eventually concluded that failed O-ring seals had caused the explosion. NASA was left shaken to its core, and the public left wondering if the space agency had the right stuff, the drive, and the vision to go on. But go on it did. Now, 49 shuttle missions later, with a host of international partners beginning to work on the International Space Station, NASA is looking beyond the shuttle to what comes next. Three, two, one, and liftoff of the uh, I think we're all very happy flying the shuttle. NASA's astronauts are not the complaining type, but they do ride yesterday's technology into the future. The space shuttle was designed in the 60s and 70s, and it could be 20 years before NASA trades in the fleet for a new generation of reusable rockets. We don't need one right now. The space shuttle's been doing fine, uh, even though a lot of the technology is what you would call by today's standards old. Um, it's proven to be a very reliable, reliable vehicle again. But there is growing concern at NASA about the expense of maintaining that reliability. The cost of replacement components for the four-vehicle fleet is rising fast, and suppliers are becoming harder to find. To tool up to build these parts that are wearing out is, would not look very cost-effective to a lot of industry out there. And, uh, and that's the only concern I would have in terms of flying this vehicle for another decade or two. By then, NASA hopes it will be ready to fly something like this, or this, or this, into low Earth orbit. The agency plans to spend nearly a billion dollars over the next three years helping private industry build an experimental rocket, the X-33, an unmanned prototype to pave the way for the next generation of manned reusable launch vehicles, or RLVs, which could reach low Earth orbit without shedding rockets or fuel tanks. From the very nose of the bird to the tail of the bird, we are starting with a clean sheet of paper and saying we're going to have a bird that is easy to operate and does have uh, robustness built into it. Easy and robust. Those were the promises when NASA officials sold Congress on the shuttle a generation ago. But the reality never came close to the sales pitch. Analysts say that's because NASA was touting an untested concept. But the X-33 program is designed to turn that approach around. Unlike the shuttle program, we're trying the technology first and then making the promises, rather than making the promises and finding the technology can't meet them. By July, NASA plans to choose one of three proposed X-33 designs, Lockheed's so-called lifting body, Rockwell's shuttle-like craft, or a rocket based on McDonnell Douglas's DCX, which has flown eight times in the New Mexico desert. It would re-enter the atmosphere nose first, then pitch around for a vertical landing. What you're seeing is, is the result of five years 
worth of work uh, with the government on our part as the contractor to get people to recognize that RLVs really can be made. New technology may in fact make it possible to build a reusable launch vehicle, which is much simpler and efficient. Since the shuttle was designed, rocket engines, heat shielding materials, and flight controlling electronics have improved dramatically. All that in theory translates into a much more streamlined operation. You've got to go from thousands of people necessary to prepare the vehicle to preferably dozens of people required to get the bird ready to fly. NASA hopes that will mean a tenfold reduction in the cost of lifting payloads and people into orbit. And that will be enough to entice private industry to build the next generation of reusable rockets. The agency can't afford to replace the shuttle on its own. If all goes according to plan, the X-33 will begin flight tests by March of 1999. The current shuttle fleet is expected to remain in service through at least 2012. This is shuttle launch control, T minus three hours and holding. Final inspection team is on the uh, mobile launcher platform, continuing their inspections of the vehicle. The team has about eight members representing NASA and the contractors, and uh, Greg Katnick of the KS of Kennedy Space Center is leading the team. The team carries a variety of instruments. One is a portable infrared scanner to measure temperatures on the cryogenic surfaces of the tank, engines, and orbiter. They also measure temperatures of the solid rocket booster cases and segment joints. This is shuttle launch control at T-minus three hours in holding. We are standing by to get live coverage of the flight crew as they're sitting down to have their pre-flight meal at their crew quarters in the operations and checkout building. The building is located at KSC's industrial area. This is the location for uh, the crew, and here we have the crew uh, sitting down at the traditional uh, table with the uh, decorated cake bearing their STS-72 insignia. We have mission specialist Koichi Wakata flying for the first time aboard the shuttle. Koichi is a, an astronaut from NASDA, uh, born in Japan. And Dr. Daniel Berry, flying for the first time aboard the shuttle this morning. Barry will be one of the EVA specialists. And pilot Brent Jett, also flying aboard the shuttle the first time. He'll be uh, monitoring, using the RMS for the uh, flight crew while they're performing EVAs. Here we have Commander Brian Duffy flying for the third time aboard the shuttle today. Uh, Duffy, the most experienced in the uh, shuttle for the whole crew. Mission Specialist Leroy Chow, he's making his second flight today aboard the shuttle. He will be involved in two of the spacewalks. And uh, serving as flight engineer, Winston Scott, uh, flying for the first time aboard the shuttle today. Again, the crew's been awake since about 7 p.m. and uh, they're getting uh, right on their schedule that they'll be following during the nine-day mission for Mission STS-72. The solid rocket booster retrieval ships departed the hangar AF on the Cape Canaveral Air Station yesterday, and uh, they are on station out of the Atlantic Ocean, about uh, 140 miles uh, due east of KSC. They will be uh, retrieving the solid rocket boosters uh, following their uh, splash down into the ocean and they will be towed back to the hangar for refurbishment. This is the uh, booster casings are uh, disassembled and refurbished uh, at the Thiokol manufacturing plant in Utah and also here at KSC at the USBI facility here at the uh, Complex 39 area. There are no problems in our countdown. Uh, countdown is proceeding on schedule and uh, per the timeline. T minus two hours, 57 minutes and counting. This is shuttle launch control.
Here we have the astronauts for Mission STS-72 coming out of their crew quarters at the uh, operations and checkout building. They'll be uh, getting into an elevator where they'll ride down to the first floor. Am I out? I can't get back no further. I'm in a pot. Crew of six, again, has been training for, uh, for the better part of the year. They uh, spent most of their time uh, training for this particular flight. Some uh, employees wishing them well. Astronaut Bob Cabana is in the blue flight suit. Uh, he'll be flying weather reconnaissance in the KSC area and making a report back to uh, the management. Down on the ground, uh, got a big crowd of uh, press, including uh, quite a large crowd of uh, Japanese uh, news media who made the trip over to see Koichi Wakata as uh, he prepares for his first flight. The crew's getting ready for their nine-day mission to retrieve uh, two satellites and uh, conduct two spacewalks and conduct a variety of experiments on the mid-deck. We have the team led by Commander Brian Duffy. external tank is now being pressurized for flight. The gaseous oxygen vent hood at the very top of the tank will be moved away, retracted back to the launch position in the next few seconds. Clear caution and warning memory, verify no unexpected errors. OTC, caution and warning is clear, no unexpected errors. Copy. Close and lock your visors, initiate O2 smoke flow, have a smooth ride and a safe landing. All right, thanks OTC, and let's get 96 off to a great start. GLS go for ET LH2 pressurization. The six-member crew is about to embark on the first day of the planned nine-day flight. The crew will retrieve the Japanese space flyer unit, deploy and retrieve NASA's OST free flyer satellite, and conduct two six-hour spacewalks. All systems aboard Endeavour are go. One minute, 30 seconds. T minus 90 seconds. Endeavour will be launched on an easterly trajectory on an orbit inclined 28.45 degrees to the equator. Endeavour's launch marks the 74th shuttle launch in the history of the program. T-minus one minute. At the T-minus 31 second point, Endeavour's onboard computers will have control of vehicle functions. few seconds, 25. thousands of gallons of water will be dumped onto the launch platform to help suppress the sound and shock of the 7 million pounds of thrust produced by the shuttle. T-minus 15 seconds, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, we have a go for engine start, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Booster ignition and liftoff of Endeavour in pursuit of a Japanese satellite. Testing monitor air time. Houston now controlling. 17218 Edward. Roll program, Houston. Roger roll, Endeavour. The roll maneuver is uh, complete aboard the orbiter Endeavour. The orbiter is now in a heads down position on course for 28 and a half degrees, 250 nautical mile orbit. 
fire unit for rendezvous and capture on Saturday morning. Endeavour's engines have now throttled down as the orbiter prepares to pass through the area of maximum dynamic pressure on the vehicle. throttling back up. Endeavour Houston, go with throttle up. Roger, go with throttle up. Endeavour's three liquid-fueled engines are now back at full throttle. The orbiter is now downrange from the Kennedy Space Center of 10 nautical miles. The orbiter's traveling 2,600 feet per second or about 1,700 miles per hour. The altitude is passing through 90,000 feet. The three hydraulic systems are in excellent shape, as are the fuel cells. The main engines are still performing at full throttle. Approaching two minutes into the flight, standing by for burnout and separation of the twin solid rocket boosters. SRB separation is confirmed. Time two minutes and 20 seconds into the flight. Endeavour Houston, performance nominal. Roger, nominal. Performance thus far in the uh, launch phase has been as expected. Endeavour is now at an altitude of 210,000 feet. Downrange from the launch site, 45 nautical miles. Now traveling 5,000 feet per second or about 3,400 miles per hour. Okay, we're there. You got A7, B7? A7, B7, and uh, how about to say five down to start? Okay. Let me take a look at that. Actually, it's not dropping at all yet, okay, so well. I'm going to start doing some braking. Okay. Up on yeah. 300. Yeah. 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 2, 3, 1, 1. That's, that's, that's real good. That's real good. No correlation. Six sixty minus point seven. What's that X dot? Let's see. Just so I don't lose it. Zero minus. Okay. Just so I don't. I don't want to let a rate build up on that. Okay. I'll help you build it. Six sixty minus point seven. Six sixty minus point seven. Zero point seven. Zero point seven. Can you get us a laser rate on the departing sap? I doubt it. I doubt it. It's going tangent to us. Uh, tangent 268. Slant slant rate rate is 0. 0.6. The slant rate is 0. 0.6. Uh, visual estimate will be fine. Um, tell them that, that it looks like it was nominal. a couple of feet per second or I don't know, it's just it's hard to tell from this range. Range? Right. Let's see. Yeah, you spend, uh, right. 250. Three inches. Two 
inches. Koichi's got it, Houston. The man would come through. Outstanding job, Endeavor.
Endeavour, the Delta did launch. Thanks, Troy. I guess we're just going by LA and Phoenix now. Clockwise, uh, your maneuver started. Clockwise, uh, your period maneuver has stopped. Clockwise period maneuver started. Thank you. And counterclockwise, a period maneuver stopped.
more than the deck. Thank you. Houston, one minute till a Tedris handover, and I have the SFU thermal bailout attitude when you're ready to copy. Vector 5, pitch 1-4, yaw 0, Omicron 2-7-0. We'll get you back at 2009, 10 minutes of Radicom off the tail when we come back. I'll give you some slack here, Leroy. Okay. How am I doing, Dan? You're doing fine. I'm doing fine. Okay. Uh, no, you do have. Uh, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Damn yeah, holding. Am I just a sec? Just a one little cut around here. Endeavor, one minute to the ZOE, get you back at 2009, 10 minutes of calm off the tail when we come back on the west. Okay, I'll do that as soon as Dan's clear. And the second, I'm going to get my cutter set properly. Forward. Another inch. Here, 
dead center. You just come straight in in defector mode. I did this all, but I'm... Oh. Okay, you're about four inches. Okay, I can put it in from here if you want to roll it around. Okay, uh, Dan, we're in the roll's exactly where it's supposed to be. I'm going to go, when you give me a go, I'm going to go for capture. But Brent, I'm showing the, the, um... And the camera's right where it's supposed to be. I'm showing the, um... The parts of the um, end effector that go into the uh, that go into the um, outside pieces, the three pieces each at 120 degrees each other. Yeah. I'm showing that off by 180 degrees. But Dan's saying there that. Okay, we have a great view, Brian. Thanks. Endeavor, Brent, uh, PDRS is looking at this. Just one moment. Hey, we're standing by. Hey, let me know when we're go for uh, capture. You go for capture. I saw a good capture. I saw the snares grow it nicely. Okay, uh, I got good capture, Dan. Let me know when you go for rigid. You go for rigid. Here comes rigid. I'm waiting. I see it rigidizing. We've got rigid. Great, fantastic. Good job, guys. Okay, now, uh, Brent, if you could uh, come uh, straight toward me a little bit. Stand by, Dan. I'm waiting for the rigid talk back. Okay, I'm sorry. And, um... Okay. Winston, if you could tell me again um, uh, where to hook the tether to, um, which end of the end effect to hook the tether to. Okay, Dan, you're going to hook the uh, hook that to the uh, yellow end of the end effector. Okay. Hey, Dan, move it down towards you. Okay, uh, stand by just one second, but I have to, stand because, by. because of the reconfig, I have to move Leroy's tether from uh, where it was to uh, the other side. So stand by. All right, we need to remember to rotate it back for storage. Okay, you're looking good. Both feet are, uh, your right foot is almost there. Right foot's in the, in the loop. Needs your heel to move. There you go. Your left's in. Your right. Your right isn't quite in. There. Now your right's in. What a sunrise. Look at that. But you know what, Leroy? Your right is above the. Uh, you know how that angle is. Okay. Let me try again. How's that? Now you're in properly, and your right and your left is in beautifully. Right. Okay. You're looking good from in here, Leroy. Okay. Then verify again that you uh, temporarily attach uh, Leroy's slide rod to the lunge run. run. Uh, negative, uh, Winston. I'm going to do that after I hook him up, so I don't have to go back and forth twice. Okay, and I can see you out of the window now. Okay, that works super. Okay, access and operate the PFRWS pitch controls. Okay, hey, Winston, I'm heading over to the um, RU. Okay, Dan. Okay, pitch control off. And I might make a pass by those windows. From my way. We're watching. Okay, Winston, pitch control works fine. Okay, Leroy, you want to access and operate the PFR that you have tool head spindle. Tool head spindle works fine. Looks good. Nice and uh, smooth action. Okay, access is going to operate the yaw control to position the PFRWS around the ATFR. Okay, and uh, that works fine. A general comment on the workstation stand and the, <clears throat> the handles are a little low. Well, they're fine for me, but someone tall, taller would uh, might be a bit of a stretch. I've had that problem in the lineup, so we'll see what happens. I guess that's most of the office, right? <laughs> oh. okay. Overall, the PWP is uh, pretty user-friendly. Great. Yeah, I know, I'm underneath it. Where 
for the flight deck. Hey, Leroy, moving up and out of the bay. Well, I don't think that'll be a big problem. So I'm going to go uh, to the other end and continue. Endeavour, Houston on the west. I've got some fast actions for the flight deck. Thank you coming down. So you know what, I'm going to see some gotcha. latch uh, alignment marks. Unless you all can see that from the window. For the flight deck, we'd like the supply water dump using FES on 5 9 er using FES B. Okay. Coming down. Okay, keep going, keep going. You're almost there. You're at it. You're at the latch. Okay, it's latched. Okay. You can see how badly the uh, yeah, cables are bound up. Cables are bound up, yeah. Now, yeah okay. I want to take a picture of that for the ground. Okay, keep going. Houston, no action on the uh, PDRS slip. That's due to the ingress uh, from Dan. Okay, we copy. Thanks, Tom.
for the flight deck. You're go for the SM checkpoint at the end of 14-7 cabin repress. And for IV and EV, the plan right now is for Leroy to proceed as planned on the timeline. For EV3, we're going to give you some easy tasks following your utility box until you both meet up at PWP setup. That's the plan for now. Copy. Okay, we copy that, Tom, uh, and uh, we'll just stand by to hear which easy tasks you want him to, to do. Okay, uh, perform the following for the task plate. The first steps are going to be a quick grab, which is three times both hands to space. Three times both hands to space. Here we go. One. intermittent leak and it's uh, understood we might have to do that again during the flight. Also we're coming up on a handover with Tidris in two minutes. It's an extended handover and we'll get you back at 1938.
Denver, Houston. The flight director wants to know who Buzz Lightyear is down there. Fred, do you remember where that grilled chicken was in Schlocker? I'll get it. Here, I'll throw it in the oven. It's in, it's in his stash. But... Yeah, he's got it stashed. <laughs> It's back here. <laughs> I'll get it on the swap out, Brian, whenever you're ready to start. You'll never find it. I'll yeah, get it. Ready. You ready? Okay. <laughs> swap. You'll never find it. I'll get it. Oh, man. You'll never find it. My heart's going, hey. Stop. <laughs>
runways inside Houston. Roger, Brian. Again, you have a six knot tailwind. Gear down and locked. Commander Brian Duffy uh, now pulling the nose of the orbiter up in the pre flare maneuver. Altitude 700 feet. Pilot Brent Jett uh, preparing to put the uh, landing gear down. And the landing gear is down and locked. Main gear touchdown. Your touchdown. Endeavour rolling out on runway 15 at the Kennedy Space Center, completing Endeavour's 10th mission in space, the 74th mission in the shuttle program, completing 142 orbits of the Earth, traveling 3.7 million miles. You did a great job of getting us started in 1996. Stand by for any post-landing deltas. Roger. 